Council, are you ready? <coughs> Call this committee of the whole meeting to order. And um, the uh, I have a question in terms of public participation. Are we going to stop for a question from the public? Um, I, I do have some items, Mr. Mayor, for the questions from the public. That, uh, okay, and if someone emails in, we could have that introduced Yeah, that's basically what that is. Yes. All right. Yeah. Council, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda for June 15th? Councillor Korlick and Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? <coughs> and um, the minutes of the Committee of the Whole for May 11th, a motion to adopt those May 11th minutes. And I see Councillor Korlick and Councillor Thompson again. Thank you, ladies. And uh, minutes, uh, any uh, business arising from those minutes? Hearing none, uh, moving on then to the first uh, delegation we have is the Boundary Museum Society quarterly report. So, Kevin, can you add our guests? Yes, we can. Probably don't need to tell you that, but it sounds official. <laughs> Good with that. April Anderson, welcome April. You're muted by default, April. You would have to unmute you. Okay, um, April, you're doing the presentation for the Boundary Museum Society. Are there any other delegates with you that we need on screen? No. No, all right, April, uh, go ahead, you're, uh, you have the floor. Oh, okay. Okay, so I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Can I share my screen then? Uh, you should be able to. Okay. Okay. All right, ready? Um, yes, as you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has made an impact on everyone in our community. And uh, we, as of March 17th, we closed our doors to the public, uh, but the office has remained open um, for a while there. I was working from home, and um, but now we've been in the office um, quite consistently, but our office is not open to the public. Um, outdoor fundraising events were have all been cancelled this year, and um, our venue rentals have been greatly impacted. We have um, one lighting, and there will be 25 guests attending um, for that. Uh, admission and donation revenues have um, dropped um, in comparison to uh, what we received last year. And the opening of our anti fire truck exhibit has been postponed. Um, we're going to be aiming for 2021 um, for that. And we do continue to be close to the public, but we are working diligently to reopen. The um, facility, yard maintenance, utilities, all that expense is still continuing with us. So our two phases to reopen are uh, phase one is uh, we are working on rearranging our exhibit space because um, due to all the um, safety precautions, we have to have a one-way flow for traffic. And um, signage, we're gonna have lots of signage regarding physical distancing, sanitization, practices and um, we are planning to pre-book tours and focus on that um, as as a way to approach it with um, limiting how many people are in the museum at once. Our outdoor areas will um, remain open during that time which will be good. We'll have some limitations obviously on that. And, uh, phase two, we plan to um, open, be working on exhibits uh, to create more of a self-directed flow so that they're not dependent on one of our um, tour guides to be in close proximity to the, the visitors. We are expanding our programming and our um, community outreach projects. We are tending to and expanding our current exhibits and we do have a lot of collection challenges and so it's a good opportunity for us to focus on that. And um, we are hoping to dedicate a space and um, welcome, more welcoming space and a gift shop and offer refreshment services for outside enjoyment after someone's had a tour here. 
So um, in the meantime, we have uh, applied for the BC Museum Association Resiliency Fund and received a $2,000 grant to this helps us with um, some of our impacted revenue. We're going to use some of that money as well, though, to apply it to creating the safety signage and sanitization measures that we need. Um, this year, uh, we have um, spent a lot of time strengthening our organization with the ethics financially and operationally through the adoption of several governance policies that are in alignment with the Canadian Museum Association, their um, ethics for museums. And we are participating in professional growth opportunities and mentorship to train and strengthen um, the local workforce. So Young Canada Works and Heritage, we have actually, I'll just go through this quick, we have hired two students uh, this summer through this program, and that's Helena Tubret. Uh, she's our archival assistant and learning program developer. We've also hired Ethan Argue. He's our heritage interpreter and our collection assistant. So we're really happy to have these two on board. They have um, our second year university students. And one of the programs we're um, working on to outreach um, and the community um, is the education kits for youths. And this project um, is focusing on empowering local youth to develop the empathetic approach to societal issues and connecting the past to the future and um, showing um, value in diversity. So we are working, working with local teachers to support the BC school curriculum and um, the learning objectives there. These are going to be available to local classrooms and homeschool groups. And we do have a letter of support for the school district on this. We also um, are focusing on our seniors and what we can do to reach them. And um, what we're doing is we're providing kits as well that can be uh, rented out to local senior homes. Um, these will stimulate thinking and help develop the social connection and um, support their emotional well-being. It will in, you know, encourage conversations about mystery objects and artifacts from the past, um, so it can be really exciting and enriching for them. And um, this is fully funded by the um, Phoenix Foundation. Our operating budget um, this year, this is our operating budget. We have an unexpected donation of $50,000 from a private estate that we received in May. And um, we are we have recommendations um, that we're, we would like to leverage this funding to address um, some of our big um, concerns here. So if we could um, focus this on our collection storage and care, this would be our number one priority. But yet, at the same time, we do have a really large priority to focus on our um, having our site accessible to um, anyone in wheelchair or with limited mobility, because as it currently is, our outdoor, new outdoor exhibit spaces across the lawn are not reachable, um, unfortunately. The Valley uh, Museum Society, we do qualify for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy of 75%. Um, it's being applied for this week. I have checked into it and do apply for it. And we are currently, right now, we're allocating a lot of funds for exhibit development. Um, due to COVID, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to put a lot of time and energy into that. And um, the educational community programming. So we really want to utilize grant applications um, to increase our revenue as much as we can. And um, one of the exciting things that I told you about before, we um, still are working on this. It's the strategic planning project. We, of course, were put um, on hold uh, for a few months here, but we are um, back into it soon. The, we did receive another $5,000 for this project from the regional district, um, their grant and aid program. This is from regional district area D. And um, we're pretty excited about that because it's a $15,000 project um, to pay for the consulting services. Our planning team, they're starting up again this month and we are interviewing um, the stakeholder um, community so that starts in July and August. And we really do want to create a new vision and mission statement to address um, the needs of our stakeholders. Our few, and, you know, that can give us direction for our future programming and projects and community priorities. And as city councillors, I, I really do hope that you um, provide your feedback. I know Kathy has sent you some information on that. So I um, really appreciate your, your feedback. 
for help us to move speed. Our antique fire truck exhibit, um, we are working on this. The trucks have been moved in. So here's a picture of, of the 1944 um, Nicole C. Gray pumper, and there's our 1901 steam pumper, and there's also a early 1900 fire wagon. That one is in the woodworker shop right now, and it is being worked on by the um, Grand First Voluntary Firefighter Association, their antique committee, as well, to restore that. But um, our museum coordinator, Aloha Snow, she's curating this exhibit and she's planning um, to put a lot of work into this and to make it worthwhile to come up and see. Grand opening will be next May. So uh, the last thing here, the Boundary Museum Society is welcoming new board members in 2020. Our AGM, due to COVID, was um, postponed. It will be um, happening on September 19th. We are looking to diversify and create inclusivity through a um, few new positions. The Boundary Museum Society welcomes interest in serving as a board member. We do have packages, and um, we're looking for anyone who has experience in any of these areas. So um, thank you for spreading the word. And staffing, just so you know what we have happening here for staffing. There's uh, myself, um, executive director. There's Sue Adrian, archives manager. And we have Aloha Snow. She's our museum coordinator slash curator. And we do have a groundskeeper who works uh, a couple hours a week on um, each time. And yes, thank you very much for your time. We, we enjoy serving the community. Well, <laughs> April, that is an amazing presentation. I, I've, I'm really impressed with it. The things you're doing with grants and the um, focus on education and youth, I think it, it really, some of the best initiatives I've seen. So uh, oh, congratulations, you. and I open council for questions or comments. Mm -hmm. um, Councillor Korlick? We have three people with hands up. Councillor yeah. Korlick? Yes, thank you, April. You just took my whole report away. <laughs> and I think you're doing really, really well. Uh, you know, it's challenging times, but you're taking advantage of the situation to the best way possible. So good going, and kudos to your whole team. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and Councillor Zelinsky. Uh, thank you. Uh, and again, April, a uh, very good presentation. Um, I have this one question as I was going through your, your, your stuff. And just because I don't know, uh, who owns the building? Who owns the land that you're on? The uh, USCC does. Thank you, that's all I have. Yeah, okay. It's on a long term lease. Council yeah, we have a long term lease, but we are responsible for 100% of the upkeep and insurance and everything involved right. in the place. So, yeah. Yeah, I just didn't see it on the balance sheet or anything, so it just came to mind. So. Councilor Thompson? Yes, thank you. Um, I just have to say I am so impressed uh, with where the museum has uh, come to and where it came from. Um, it was uh, pretty um, disastrous back in the uh, in, in 2000, I believe it was 2008, because that's what got me back into uh, interest in becoming a counselor. For, things that have happened to the, to the museum. And um, I, I just, I'm very excited <clears throat> for the direction that you're, you're leading them in for lots of the uh, fantastic, fantastic job. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Councillor Studley. Oh, I didn't have anything at this point, but just, yeah, keep up the good work for sure. Anything, so. And Councillor Moslin. Yes, thanks. Thanks, April, for the presentation. Uh, now, I too am impressed with the resilience of the Boundary Museum Society and the transformation of that site. Uh, one, one thing that sticks out from my presentation that really makes me appreciate how you might be working with other parts of the community are your outreach kits, uh, especially for classrooms. Yeah. That really locked my interest with seniors. Uh, <laughs> And uh, if you can, encourage, I would encourage you to work with whatever, whomever will come forward uh, uh, to help you with that. I'm thinking about, you know, outreach to our senior, senior care homes. I know that's a real difficult thing at this time, but 
a lot of people who could use some outreach out there. Thank you, that's my comment. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And uh, back to Councillor Corlock, who is the representative to the museum. Nobody missed that. Yeah, just a quick thing. I noticed in the um, agenda or minutes something about Rick Hansen assessment. What's going on with that? Um, yeah, I have found out that the Rick Hansen, like through their organization, they don't do that anymore. They have the information up on their website, but um, but there are a whole bunch of qualified people who do do it, and I'm just in the process of researching and finding someone that we're happy with to offer that service to us, but we're definitely planning to go ahead and have an assessment done, and that's the first step. In order to apply for grant funding, we do need to basically prove our need and um, that we've had a professional come in and have an assessment done. Okay, Revital, Councillor Corlick. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that looks like all the questions, and uh, April, thank you very much. It certainly uh, impressed the whole of Council that was well put together in very progressive directions. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Council. Gallery 2, quarterly report, is the next uh, delegation we have. Okay, Tim, we have, there we go, now we've got video. All right. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. All right, Tim, um, quarterly report, what's up at the, at the uh, uh, art gallery? You're on. All right, I'm just going to share my screen here. And, oh, wait. All right. Let me share my screen. There we go. Uh, huh. Oh, wait. Screen one, screen two. One. Sometimes I just hold down, so. Um. Can everyone see my screen now? No. No. Oh. Oh, great. <laughs> um. Share. There we go. Okay, Some something happened. happened. Gallery oh. two. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Can you see my presenter view or my actual plan? Uh, we can see your correct, it's the correct view. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Um, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to share the part of the report. This is obviously a very strange time uh, for everyone and I appreciate the opportunity. So I'm gonna dive right in, cast your minds back to March um, this is just an update on our year end, which ended March 31st, 2020. Um, if you look at uh, total revenue and expenses, we ended the year um, pretty much on budget for revenue and a bit over on expenses. We had a total net revenue of negative $13,000. Most of this is attributable to our fundraising events. We. Um, we're perhaps a little over optimistic in ticket sales and we went to a new model of uh, event delivery that increased our cost there. So that pretty much is that net revenue issue there. Um, a couple of other notes on this and these are numbers that don't appear in our operating budget. Um, we did several capital projects in 2020, uh, total revenues and expenses on that was just under $28,000. And that's our exterior lighting upgrades, which we completed, as well as a whole slew of lobby, IT, and electrical upgrades. Uh, these projects were funded largely through the Phoenix Foundation and DC Gaming Capital Grants. And we're actually, I'll get to it later on, but we're actually continuing with our DC Gaming Capital Grants uh, during the closure right now. The other thing is the board endowed a first three um, 
when Wendy Butterfield retired, and this came out of our internally restricted fund. So technically it shows as an expense on the year. And then the biggest impact uh, on our year-end numbers is that Don and Reed request that I talked about back in March. So that's going to show as an additional revenue of $180,000, which is going to make things look rather good. Um, just a note again with that, uh, that request, the board has chosen to internally restrict it for use with capital projects and building upgrades, which is a really uh, great opportunity for us to leverage the money and uh, keep, keep taking care of the facility as we grow into this range of time that we find ourselves in. So our anticipated final numbers uh, at the end of the year is going to be a revenue of $567,000 and expenses of just over $400,000. So it's going to end up looking pretty good. Now moving ahead, um, the third fraction of everyone's presentation I'm sure is the COVID-19 impact and where we're going with that. So much like um, other organizations across the province, we closed in mid-March um, due to the general provincial shutdown. We weren't technically ordered to close, but it certainly seemed like the right thing to do. My priorities through this and the board's priorities has been um, our, the health and wellness of our employees and our community and making sure that we're doing everything we can to keep everybody safe and um, working as best as possible. So I'm really proud we've been able to retain all of our staff. Um, we haven't had to make any layoffs and we've been able to continue to safely work on site. This did uh, involve modifying some schedules and routines so that we could um, meet everybody's needs, but we've been able to keep um, delivering arts and culture programming and working behind the scenes throughout this closure. The other piece with um, keeping people on and keeping operating in the building is really just trying to establish a, as much of a sense of normalcy for myself and the staff as possible. It's been really um, helpful, I think, for people to be able to come in and keep in touch with um, a little bit of reality um, as we try to navigate through these, these strange and unprecedented times. And then the other piece of this is we really quickly had to pivot to online engagement. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, if you remember back in October, we launched our new website and uh, the timing couldn't have been better on that because it's really allowed us to um, be flexible and offer online engagement. Um, we launched our art prompts, which has been really popular within the community um, because that's picked it up uh, weekly. And it's also a way of us engaging with the community through our permanent collection. So that's been quite um, great for us to stay on the radar of the community and provide that link to culture that I think people, uh, as they've been home and, and through this closure, um, have really responded well to that. Of course, um, we had numerous cancellations uh, in terms of what we missed. Uh, the Honor Showcase being the biggest one, that's our annual um, community art exhibition. And we're going to take the opportunity with this um, to relaunch it in November. Um, that's going to allow us to have it up for longer. And uh, we'll tweak the format a bit, but we're going to keep that um, non jury community feel to it and provide the community with the opportunity to showcase their work. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see what's come out of this, uh, this time. People hopefully working on art at home. The other piece, and we do this concurrent with the Modern Showcase, is the Art Attack Exhibition, which is our partnership with uh, FIST and the SD51. It's the culmination of a year of work by various student groups, and it's a really great opportunity for us to showcase their work in a gallery setting. Now, of course, this year we had to cancel it, so we just last week launched uh, an online presentation of it. So it's a chance for the participants to see their work on the website and uh, show it off to their family and stuff. There is, uh, obviously there's no replacement for the physical being in the gallery there, but it's, it's been an opportunity for us to, uh, to help with the presentation of that work. This means we've been pivoting to online. We were also planning our Take a Seat, uh, the second annual Take a Seat fundraiser in uh, coordination with Habitat for Humanity. 
This we're still going to go ahead with. We've postponed it until we open our fall exhibitions in August. And uh, we'll also uh, be offering an online uh, opportunity for getting inside that option as well. So if the, the chairs that have arrived are any indication that the caliber of work is really great and there's going to be some really great chairs up for option, so stay tuned to that. And then the biggest piece for us, of course, is our summer exhibitions program um, has been thrown into total disarray. Um, so we basically rescheduled uh, the exhibitions that we were planning for this summer to next summer. Um, so that we can offer them safely and give them the time and um, profile that they deserve. Uh, it's disappointing to have to wait that long, but it's better than throwing them up for a few weeks and having nobody come. So there's been a lot of shuffling things around um, and a lot of coordinating and communicating kind of things going on. The other piece is uh, projects that we've been up to while we've been closed. As I mentioned, all of the staff has stayed on, and it's been really my priority to keep everyone occupied and busy with those projects that are nice to get to, but we never do because there's always other things going on. So we've been planning on updating our point of sale system in gift shop, so we've leapt into that and have gone through the inventory with the fine tooth comb, and we'll be launching that with our reopening. This is really going to change uh, and transform how the gift shop operates in terms of inventory management and tracking of orders and stuff. It's, it's going from the 1800s to the mid 20th century in one cell suite. So that's very exciting. We also implemented our online records management plan, which again is one of those things where you just need to take a lot of time to go through it. And uh, well, uh, it's great to be able to just get that and draw a line under it. Uh, we've Final piece of implementation on our website was our online our rental catalog launch, um, which is live now, as well as online membership renewal. And as I mentioned, we've um, moved into our 2020 capital project update, um, which is primarily the carpet uh, upgrades. Uh, we've replaced them in the lobby. It looks fabulous. Um, I can't wait to welcome you all back. And then there's the cleaning and reorganizing. Um, I think everybody in the cultural facility is going to have clean and organized uh, areas for, uh, for years to come. And then, of course, it's difficult to underestimate the amount of time and energy it takes to prepare the report. So looking forward to our budget 2020, um, the silver lining with this is our budget gets approved at the end of March, so we were able to adjust this year's budget to reflect some of the reality. I don't need to tell you that there's a lot of uncertainty around um, things moving forward. Uh, what we have done is dramatically reduce our fundraising and earned revenue expectations uh, in order to hopefully align them with reality and be, I'd rather lowball those and be pleasantly surprised than count on income that is uh, not going to come in. We have received excellent um, and very stable support from our major funding partners. This includes, of course, the United Forest, our people service agreement, but also the BC Arts Council, Destination BC, and BC Gaming have all been great with communications and resources, as well as uh, reassurement around uh, funding and not panicking, um, which is great for not-for-profits because we immediately go to worrying about funding cuts. Um, we've also received additional support for COVID mitigation through um, various partner organizations. And we are eligible for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which uh, will make a huge difference for us this year. So I'm cautiously optimistic um, moving forward that we can, uh, we can make it through the next year and come out, uh, if not better than ever, at least uh, in good shape moving forward. So our path to reopening um, has been well thought out. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot of this from other organizations, but uh, as for WorkSafe BC, we've developed our workplace safety plan. This has involved working with staff on all levels of planning, and it's really involved with us rethinking how we use, use the building and how we uh, provide access control to it. So the biggest thing on me for us has been this need to control building access and monitor who's in the building and where they are. So we're pivoting to um, transitioning 
using a single entry through the front doors only. So this lovely front entrance is truly going to be the front entrance to the building. And this is means meant creating an admissions area in the main lobby. So we've relocated the desk and visitor services, and this will provide the first point of contact for all visitors to the building. And really will ensure that we can manage our numbers and communicate with visitors and keep everyone safe. Now, this um, new model of operating is requiring increased staff resources, and we have brought on another contract staff person to help us with that piece, again, so that everybody that comes in the building is greeted by a staff person um, who orients them to what's going on. Some of the details, um, mechanical barriers are on order. We're increasing building cleaning and sanitization. We're providing sanitizer and lots of it. And uh, the biggest piece for us has been communication to come back and setting expectations in advance. Um, we're launching detailed procedures on our website. And this is really um, where some of our partners with the BC Museums Association have been working with us to develop best practices around these things and really figuring out the best way to provide an open and inviting experience uh, while simultaneously making sure that everyone's safe and uh, obeying the rules. Um, and then the biggest piece with this is training for our employees, both around our internal COVID procedures and then around the external communications and our messages to visitors. I really want everybody um, on our staff again to be comfortable in the building and to feel comfortable welcoming, welcoming people in. Our timeline on this is we're targeting next Tuesday for reopening. Um, this is assuming that the barriers arrive on time. And the plan is to hold our current exhibitions over until July 25th. But I'm not sure if anyone, any of you had a chance to come in and see um, our installation pieces right now. But I, all I will say is that it's worth seeing Ian Johnson's video work for the hand washing sequence alone. Um, both our uh, exhibitions took on a new meaning during the pandemic, and I'm really excited to welcome people back to see it. We're also pivoting uh, our online summer camps, uh, or our summer camps are being cancelled in person, but we're going to offer online camp programming launching July 7th, and this will be a, a, a video-based um, program that launches every week. So again, building on the strength of that art prompts program, and pivoting using our web resources to offer that arts and culture programming to the community. And then the last piece is we're bringing up our fall exhibition opening to August 8th. Um, and I'm really excited to get back to what we do, which is spectacular exhibitions and arts and culture. So just a little teaser, our fall exhibition is this sprawling um, show called Grand Theft Terra Firma. It's circulated by the Reach Gallery, Gallery in Abbotsford. It's won numerous awards, and it's a great opportunity for us to partner with a larger institution. Um, the artists are David Campion and Sandra Shields, and the concept of the show is they've reconfigured the colonial narrative uh, using the Grand Theft Auto um, paradigm. So there's um, large screenshots from a, a video game, the Grand Theft Terra from a video game, whereby the goal of the game is to lie and cheat and steal the land. So it's really uh, quite um, pertinent to a lot of the conversations that are going on, and I think will provide a really interesting um, opportunity to talk, talk about reconciliation and how we move forward. And showing it in our century colonial building is going to be a really um, excellent experience. So hope so. I'll see you all at those exhibitions as we move forward. And thanks for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tim. I'm, clearly, you know, you should get the uh, ADAPT award for what you've done, and, and relevance and um, your, your pertinence to, to social issues and community issues. I'm, I'm again, a good report, and uh, you're adapting well. And we have a number of questions, starting with Councillor Thompson. Oh. Thank you. Um, excellent presentation, Tim. And um, uh, I'm going to note on my calendar that you're open, hoping to reopen on Tuesday. So uh, all things being equal, I will try and get down there. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I will say uh, check the website before you come down, um, just in case. And that's 
the main part with this communication piece is we're, we're really working hard to push all communication through the website. So that's the, the latest and greatest information there. But it's looking good for Tuesday, for sure. Good. Thank you. Councillor Korlick. Thank you for such a complete report. Again, you're taking advantage of the situation that's out there right now, and I think you're doing a great job. So, well done, and I think it's great that we're looking at reopening. So, congratulations. Good work. Councillor Studley. Yeah, I was just wondering what uh, format you decided to use for a POS, if it was a square or some other format. Oh, that's a great question. Um, we've gone with a product called Lightspeed. Um, it's uh, used, the biggest thing for us was something that would work with both the consignment model and uh, a hotel model, and it's used by similar organizations, large and small, so I think we're really going to be really happy with it. Thank you, and seeing no other questions, I want to thank you, Tim, again for a great presentation and uh, uh, making us a healthy community. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, and I hope to see you at the gallery um, at a safe distance. <laughs> you bet. Thank you. All right, Council, the, uh, the next item of business is the 19th Street Restoration, and I believe Mr. Molner will be presenting. Les, um, without any further ado, um, can I give the floor to you for your presentation here as a delegate? Okay. I, uh, I don't know all the councillors, but uh, uh, thank you, Mayor Taylor and the city councillors for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the 19th Street residents before council today. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you here. Okay, um, I'm referencing today our written submission to Council for your consideration as well. Uh, we've been in contact with all five of our neighbors regarding the Kettle River stream bank erosion situation that has occurred over the last three years causing increased risk to our properties and our homes. Two of the of our neighbors thought that the restoration works were going to proceed this year in September and three of them were going to write letters to the city regarding uh, their expression of risk to their properties. Um, I, I did tell them that the works were not slated to be done in September of this year and that was their concerns that they were going to express to you. The river banks on the 19th Street uh, reach did not change from 1963 until 2018. But what has changed over the last 50 years is the big white development, extensive clear cutting and road building on the West Kettle River, and high stream flows. Over the past three years at our property at 6169 19th Street, we've lost three and a half meters of a large portion of our riverbank, which is now less than five meters from our home foundation. If the river encroaches closer during any high water event, our home will be at critical risk. Other neighbors have similar concerns. Oh, sorry, I've lost you now. Hello? No, we can hear you, Les. Oh. I saw a picture of the river there. Anyway, uh, the 19th Street delegation is re requesting council to immediately prioritize the restoration works along our reach of the river. In that regard, we're requesting city staff to engage the two leasing ministries responsible for the stream works 
to seek their assistance in getting this done sooner than later. Um, I understand clearly council's situation in protecting the most properties and and um, how they prioritize work to affect the, the uh, largest part of the population. My concern is there's no reason why the work on 19th Street can't be done uh, even before the other work is done. In other words, projects carried, carried forward simultaneously. So we're requesting the council to engage the contracted engineering firm selected under your RFP to draw preliminary engineering plans for restoration works and to immediately thereafter proceed with any application or cons consultation processes under the provincial statutes. We also request the city to arrange a meeting between your senior city staff, the senior regional BC ministry staff, and the 19th Street residents to discuss our concerns and start the consultation process. This year, the River Forecast Center at one time was modeling 10% over 2018 floods. And now we had a very uncomfortable uh, three days watching our rivers rise. The 19th Street residents are requesting a compassionate response from council to action the restoration works in our north neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molnar. And council comments, questions? I'm not hearing any hands there. Yes, I do. Mr. Moslin, Councillor Moslin. Yes, thanks, Mayor. And uh, thanks, Mr. Molnar, for bringing your, uh, your case and situation forward uh, in person. Uh, I think the staff is well aware of, of the situation uh, and um, th that, uh, of the loss of your property and of the growing risk uh, to, to your property. The whole situation, as you know less, and I think Council's aware, is tied up in what we're going to be discussing uh, throughout the day, and that is uh, the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, and the Charter and the operational plans of that. You know, I, I, I have a tendency, uh, and I'm, I'm going to comment throughout the day on that, especially uh, on the uh, prioritization matrix that is presented within the, that uh, uh, presentation and less you can probably find it if you leaf through the agendas that are available to the public. Uh, I, I, I believe that it's not only just compassion uh, to help uh, deal with Mr. Mulner and his neighbors, but it will also make economic sense for us to uh, uh, protect what we have rather than wait to maybe lose it. Um, anyhow, I, 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 as Council knows, I, I would like to examine the priority of works. These are all scheduled works that are within the scope of DMAF. And now what we're trying to avoid is another freshet for this neighborhood to endure. In fact, if we were, if there's a risk that there might be two more freshets if we follow the charter, a proposed schedule of works. Thank you. Anyhow, uh, that's it. For, uh, so I have no question. Good luck, Les. Uh, 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 we have seen satellite photos of your of your lot. Uh, I did stand on the city land that adjoins uh, the river. That is, I think I believe it's the end of 62nd, 61st. Anyhow, there is a city laneway there, and uh, have observed the undercutting of the soils. I, 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 question, I guess my question for you, Les, is: Are you still under alert? No, I, I don't believe so. No. 
You're not under alert? Okay. You were under order for a few days. We were under alert. We were never under order. I think the order is a is an order to evacuate. We were under uh, advisement, I guess it is. So, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's my points, Mayor. Councillor Johnson. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation, and please be assured that I will be taking uh, your comments into uh, consideration on any decisions that that uh, council is going to be asked to make. Okay, and uh, Susan and I, from a personal note, we really appreciate the work that council has done with uh, the Ruckel residents. We were always hoping that you'd be able to come up with solutions there. And it appears that uh, it's moving forward and the compassion that you've shown to those residents, I think the majority of people really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Molnar. And um, you, you can see that we will be discussing this further in the agendas today. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and just a, a note to, uh, or a question, I suppose, is, do you formally get back to the delegation as to your decisions, or how does that work? Uh, in this situation, I think it would be formal. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Molnar. Bye-bye. Okay, Council. And as we move forward here to the next um, item, the Alcar Investment Update uh, and this is for clarity the Tim Horton application on 441 Central. And uh, um, Mr. Redfern, did you want to introduce this at all? Um, so through your through your worship, the only thing we would introduce is is that uh, the DP was a two-year DP, Dolores, and it is coming up uh, for expiration here within the next month, I believe. July fourth. July 4th. And uh, so the update today is in advance of possibly another request for that DP uh, or a DP similar. All right, and I see we have uh, three people in the uh, gallery here, Mac and Alan and Ryan. Uh, welcome. And uh, do you have any? Uh, do you have a formal request here, uh, uh, Alan? Uh, yes, uh, we have a formal request. Uh, my name is Alan Hanover. I'm the owner of uh, All Car Investments, which owns the shopping center, the Savon Shopping Center, and I'm the proponent of putting the Tim Hortons on the southwest corner of the parking lot. We're requesting that the existing development plan be extended. We had the building permit reinitiated earlier this spring, and the uh, development permit that was in place as of two years ago is coming up for renewal and or expiring in July so we'd like to uh, have that extended so that we can start building this fall and finish next spring. But at this point I'd like to introduce Mark Weiner and Ryan Searsma of Dillard Consulting who will uh, stick handle the presentation here. That's great. Thank you Alan. Um, so yeah, Ryan Searsma from Dillard Consulting. Um, I guess I can share my my presentation right now if that works. And yes, works. Can, uh, walk through it. Just bear with me for one moment. Okay, so I think probably you'll see well, presentation. Can you confirm, Alan? Is it up now in front of your screen? We yes, can it see is. it. Great, thank you. So, uh, thanks, thanks for your time today for allowing us to present uh, an update to your to your council. Um, this is a very similar presentation that we gave a couple of years ago uh, during the initial applications. Um, so it might be familiar to some, but I recognize that a number of uh, councillors, including the mayor, has uh, changed seats. So the Tim Hortons. Uh, in Grand Forks on Central Avenue is a project that's been going on for a couple of years and we'll get into a little bit of the detail but this presentation is just very high level to give you an understanding of the work that's been to date and the groups that are involved. Uh, I think overall um, and this was said uh, in the prior presentation uh, the group's really happy to be working with the, uh, the city of Grand Forks and uh, trying to get this off the ground. 
Our presentation will go through a little bit of the ownership groups, some of the work that's done with the key stakeholders, the design elements specifically for the Grand Forks. Uh, Tim Hortons has been proposed, uh, a little bit of some concepts on the, on the signs, and then we can touch on FL potential because I know that was mentioned and asked in the previous council presentations. So uh, just a brief overview. Um, so myself and Mark Weiner are with Dillon Consulting. We are a, a national planning, engineering, and environmental firm um, with offices across the country. Um, we have offices in Western Canada, uh, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Vancouver, our, uh, in Western Canada, Edmonton is on this map as uh, it was opened just recently. We do planning permitting for Tim Hortons uh, across the country with them, several hundred um, Tim Hortons um, in Western Canada. So the restaurant owner group, uh, Paul and Barrel, they own uh, several um, Tim Hortons in the lower uh, British Columbia area. They have six uh, right now that are in operation um, and they have 26 uh, years of experience uh, delivering restaurant uh, business to communities. They are very excited to, to come to the community. Uh, we're just working through some challenges with our uh, tendering and, and construction at this time. So I'll switch it over to the next slide and have Alan just present his company, a little overview of the work that he's done in the area. Uh, yes, uh, I'm the owner of All Car Investments, which is which is a short of my name, Alan, and my wife's name, Karen. And we own the shopping center since February of 2007. Uh, immediately, I had the dream of having a Tim Hortons on the shopping center. Uh, looking at Grand Forks as being a small town like uh, that I grew up in, which was Salmon Arm, and uh, really feeling the connection being a small town guy. Uh, so. I it lobbied uh, Savon and the Overweighty over the years and finally they agreed that it was a great idea and we approached Tim Hortons and over the last three and a half years uh, from initially getting their uh, endorsement, uh, we went through the building permit phase, the development plan phase in 2018, went out to tender twice in 2018, however with the overheated construction industry in uh, British Columbia, we couldn't get the pricing down to where we could afford to build the, the Tim Hortons. Uh, this spring, we have connected with all local contractors in the Grand Forks, Christina Lake area, and with all local subtrades. So I had a meeting there two weeks ago with the uh, main contractor and all the subcontractors, and face-to-face uh, -face meetings once we're allowed to travel. And, Pretty excited about having everything built by local uh, boundary area contractors, and that's what I'm looking forward to getting it done this fall. Okay, over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Alan. So uh, most folks will be familiar with the site. Um, as Alan mentioned, there are a few existing tenants: uh, the Savon Already Group, uh, BC Liquor, as well as Fields. Uh, initially, there were some concerns from the uh, tenant group, and that was particular on parking and uh, visibility from the street, uh, just not wanting to uh, have a Tim Hortons or block um, visibility of through traffic, which we think will be addressed in the pylon sign, uh, which we'll share with you shortly. So I'll turn over to Mark Weiner um, from Dillon um, to sort of ex ex you know, ex share some details on the site plan uh, that we just threw in here for reference. Just needed to unmute myself there. Um, so, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, generally, the site plan, the, the existing site is the Save on Foods parking lot. The southeast corner uh, of the of the lot itself is where the Tim Hortons building would be located. Uh, the drive-through entrance comes off of uh, Fifth Street. The existing access on Fifth Street would be relocated north. And so along with that, um, the angle parking on 5th Street would need to be shifted around to accommodate the, uh, the new entrance and the closure of the other existing entrance. Um, the existing entrance on 4th Street uh, would remain, or actually would be shifted to the north as well. And so along with that, um, instead of having parallel parking on 4th Street, we've included four angle parking. Uh, and then on-site parking 
uh, for the most part, would remain the same. There would need to be some shifting around in terms of uh, parking stalls, but everything would be repainted in the end, of course, to uh, to account for uh, the changes in the, the parking layout. Um, so generally, the the entrance comes off of Fifth Street to the. I mean, probably come off Fourth Street and go in front of the Save On Foods, but uh, the drive-through drive-through entrance runs on the. Uh, on the east side, heading to the south south end, and then coming out on the uh, on the south end of the uh, the building there. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. I guess we've also included some parking on the on seventy fifth to the north, where there's fourteen new parking stalls as well that will be located there. They'll remain gravel, um, not not paved. Um, that's that's all I had, Ryan. Thanks. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, I guess what we should point out to is it's largely, largely unchanged from what was uh, presented to council in 2018. I think there's been some slight modifications, just as the design got a little more advanced and more detailed, uh, but nothing that would uh, change the overall intent of what was presented earlier. Um, so just a couple notes on the design elements. When we were going through the uh, the development permit stage um, in the past, uh, it was it was um, necessary and ask that uh, Tim Hortons uh, adapt their traditional standard to meet the design uh, elements of Grand Forks. Uh, in this case, uh, the interior layout has been, uh, been modified from my welcome design, which is their new uh, standard interior layout, but the exterior is a uh, cottage feel for a gable roof line that uh, we think really would uh, complement some of the existing buildings within the downtown core um, and add uh, sort of a sort of a standalone piece uh, on the site. Uh, the character is really consistent with the, the planning goals of most of the documents within the, uh, the CA Grand Forks. So these are the design pictures which were presented previously. Uh, you can see the, the gabled uh, arches here, uh, the timber accents with uh, the stone along the base. And I'll just skip through quickly. There's a a couple different uh, elevations uh, for you to review. This would be the, the back of the drive through, and this is uh, just some uh, logistical uh, loading entrance. So, um, as we previously mentioned, there were some concerns about uh, visibility, and Alan uh, really wanted to make sure that we could represent and, and present which tenants are located within the uh, actual development. Um, very uh, uniquely from the street. Uh, so Alan had uh, engaged a, an architect to design the uh, two options for a timber uh, sign uh, column, which would obviously um, have all tenant signs on the actual uh, pylon sign. Alan, I don't know if you want to expand a little bit on uh, on that. I know you were talking to some local contractors yes. as well. Uh, yes, the design that's on the right hand side has been the finalized design. It's meant to be a representation of a uh, train trestle, which one would see on the Kettle Valley Railroad. Uh, the timbers are going to be made of 18 inch by 18 inch fir uh, beams that would either we've uh, contracted either with uh, Pioneer Lock Homes in Williams Lake or Canadian Timber Frames in Golden. We have competitive bids from both those companies. So we're pretty excited to have this rather unique and striking uh, signage uh, that would go in the southeast corner of 4th and Central Avenue. And then on top, uh, there's a silhouette there. That would be, uh, we're endeavoring to get a silhouette of an actual steam train from 100 years ago and have that uh, laser cut uh, and uh, painted black to mount on top of it to uh, also tie in with 4th Street used to be a railway siding, so it brings it back full circle from over 100 years ago to the present. Thanks, so. Alan. So the final slide we have is just uh, a little bit on economic potential. Um, we're estimating about 12 to 1,500 uh, customers per day coming into the, uh, the Tim Hortons. Um, we really think, uh, and we've talked extensively as a as a group about promoting the downtown core and um, effectively making this a, a stop um, that would trigger people to, to explore the downtown core instead of uh, people just driving through. Um, 
30 to 35 local employees would be needed, and uh, we spoke about this at the first council meeting, but these are primarily uh, entry-level jobs, which uh, are, are great for the uh, local community. Um, the restaurant owner group uh, does have a very you know, competitive and uh, uh, comprehensive employment package, uh, as well as a, a fairly substantial uh, average staff uh, hourly rate at their facilities. And that's uh, the gist of our presentation. Like we said, we wanted to keep it pretty high level um, and just provide a short update on, on the actual project and where it sits today. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen, and then if there's any questions, uh, I'm sure Mark, Al, and myself would be happy to answer. Thank you, gentlemen, and we'll open for questions from Council. And I see Councillor Zielinski is first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, great presentation, fellas. Um, one thing that you, sh that you uh, should know that I don't know that you can share with me is, do you know how the traffic come on Highway 3 during the summer? Do we have that, Mark? I see you nodding or looking maybe quickly. And we, just, it, it, I don't I think we have that in front of us. I haven't heard it, so. Yeah, the, um, the Ministry of Transportation does post uh, at specific locations. I'm not sure if it's within town, though. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the information, uh, I don't, I, sometimes it varies, too, in terms of when they've collected it, if it's, uh, it's in the summer or winter, you know, so the seasonal variation, of course, with that. So um, I can't recall specifically, though, going back on the, the, the transportation side of things, if there was uh, the traffic counts were looked at uh, at the time. Um, okay, maybe yeah. a more difficult, more a more difficult question is with your customer count or, or what you guess as your customer count. Do you know how many of those might be local as as opposed to the drive-through uh, uh, people we have from town? I don't know specifically on the um, Alan. That might be something where it came up through the economic analysis on the split between local versus uh, flow through? Well, we were hoping that we would have a lot of local traffic. Um, Central Avenue uh, has a certain amount of traffic that goes by back and forth across it every day, and you know, which is seasonal as well as local traffic. Um, there would be anticipated that there would be no increase overall traffic at any one point of the year because traffic's going by and said that they would be stopping in the Tim Hortons and staying hopefully each shopping in the downtown core rather than driving through and not stopping or going somewhere else. So what we're hoping is that the Tim Hortons is sort of a catalyst to bring more customers to the downtown core and encourage people to shop downtown. All right, we made the presentation with the formal council. We had a uh, conversation with the uh, Ministry of Transportation and Highways, and with the traffic flow that we had proposed out of, off of Fourth and Fifth Street, moving the entrances back and allowing for uh, turning lanes on Fifth, and then restricting turning off of Fourth that uh, the impact would be negligible for the overall traffic in the area. So, so you will have a turning lane off uh, um, off Central 1 to 5th? Well, there is on on 5th right now, there is a left turning lane uh, on Central down to 5th already. So any traffic that is going to be going eastbound from the shopping center would be directed to 5th where there's a, a stoplight. So they could come to the stoplight and turn eastbound or westbound. Any traffic that's going westbound would be directed to go to 4th Street. They would come to Central Avenue and then turn right and go westbound on there. So that's where the traffic flow from the drive-through would be split between the two intersections. <clears throat> All right, me. thank you, Councillor. Giving up the floor to Councillor Moslin. Yes. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for the presentation. You know, I'll be a local customer for sure. However, um, I, I, I guess my concerns are about the egress of the drive-through. Maybe you could go through that explanation again. When I look at the map that you presented on screen, I took a screenshot so I can at least expand it. Um, 
Uh, I see that the, the, the basically the drive through seems to have egress coming in from the west side. This is along the south side, parallel to central. And it goes through the drive through window. I guess what I can't see on the map is after the cars exit the drive through window, where do they uh, get back on the Highway 3? Do they get back, do they... Can you explain that to me? There is no, there is no, there is no plan of a, a, a new entrance into the mall, is there, between 4th and 5th? I'm okay, <clears throat> so to, to let me explain, explain, the existing entrances to the shopping center are on 5th Street and 4th Street, and they're about a quarter of the way down the block. So we would be relocating both of those entrances northward so that the uh, entrance would then, and, and traffic flow would come in off of 5th and go straight across the front of the main shopping center and the other ingress, egress would be on 4th Street. So we'd be now then more than halfway down the block. Most traffic would be coming into the Jim Hortons off of 5th so they would turn on the 5th Street, go north on 5th Street, turn right into the shopping center, immediately turn right, and because of the double stack design, we would be able to accommodate up to 22 or 23 vehicles in that drive-through. They would, they would do their ordering on a double order uh, on the stack drive-through, come around to the pickup window where they would pay, and then there would be directional signs uh, showing people how they get back onto the highway. And as I mentioned previously before, people who are not familiar with Grand Forks, people that are driving through, if they were going westbound, they would be directed to the 4th Street. So they would drive towards the, the main shopping center, turn right to go along the front of Savon on the 4th Street and come back to Central Avenue and then turn west. If they're heading eastbound they would be directed to 5th Street and they would come uh, southbound on 5th Street and where there is a traffic light where they can either turn west or east or straight through. So that mitigates any of the congestion area because of the stoplight that's on 5th Street allowing for left and right turns. Thank you and uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you. It's just a couple of questions I guess directed more to Alan. Um, where in relation to the building is the um, window going to be for people that are just ordering and, and taking out? Is that going to be on the east side? Are you are you talking about the drive through windows? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you look on the uh, presentation, the double stack of the drive through is where people do their ordering. And once they order, the traffic flows around the corner, so and then it'll be parallel to Central Avenue, but the vehicles will be pointed east, is where they will be picking up on the south side of the building. The vehicles will be pointed east. They pick up, and then they go around the patio, heading towards the <clears throat> main part of the shopping center, where they would then turn left or right to the new uh, drive driveway that goes along the front of the building there. Thank you. Thank you. I just wasn't really clear on that. Can, and you, see my, can you see my cursor moving here? Uh, no. No, okay. I, no. Um, um, now we can. Yeah, yeah if, 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 I, if I may, Mr. Mayor, um, the uh, presentation, I just sent the presentation on to all of Council, so if Council wants to check the email. Oh, okay. Thank well, thank you, you Daniel. Um, and just a couple of other quick things. Um, how many in the in the restaurant? Are, uh, how many seats will be there? Uh, Thirty-nine to forty-one seats. Okay. And and finally, you're talking about uh, parking um, um, on Fourth and and Fifth. Have you worked with the city department on um, work? To, to, to rearrange those, those parking stalls? Uh, yes, we're going to be putting angle parking along 75th along the back of the store. 
primarily for employees of the shopping center. Right now, the employees uh, park in the main shopping center, and, and, it, and it, we all notice that during the uh, the winter months, uh, the shopping center is more than generously uh, has more shopping space. I mean, parking spots than it needs, and so they don't typically haul away the snow removal. They pile it up and let it melt in the spring. Uh, so overall, even though with the Tim Hortons in there, with the angled parking along 75th and angled on 4th Street, we'll have the same number of parking spots as we originally have on the shopping center. Okay, but uh, the, the parking along 4th Street, that is that city property or is that your own property? Uh, that'll be, that's on city-owned property. It's parallel now, but it'll be changing to angled parking along 4th Street. Okay, so you have worked with our engineering department on that. Yes, Thank yes, you. we have done that. Thank you. Councillor Corlick. Just quickly, so this is a design, something like they have in Fernie. Because when I, I think about that and how it comes parallel, it looks to me like it's the same plan or pretty much the same design and as they have there where you have to come around and the main entrance to a walk in traffic will be facing the parking lot, yes? Uh, yes, the main entrance for pedestrians will be people would be shopping at Save On or at the liquor store and they would walk up onto the main entrance for, for people, walk-ins would be on the north side and on the east side where the patio is. Okay, okay. And uh, so to accommodate snow removal, in winter, how are you gonna do that? Uh, I would think that the uh, they will have to end up hauling it away if they have an overabundance of uh, snow. Okay, just curious because my husband does the snow removal there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Council, I don't see uh, there. Yes, I do. Councilor Moslin. Yeah, yeah, I guess, Your Worship, uh, I, 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 I'm looking at the layout. I, I know that the, uh, the main entrance is on the north side of the building. But the high flow area, the high visibility side, is the south side. I mean, that's where thousands of people flow by a day uh, along Highway 3. And uh, I don't know. I just, I almost think it's too, too bad we couldn't reverse it, put the showy entrance on the south side where everybody from the highway can see it, uh, or whatever. Uh, I, I do appreciate the uh, attempt to uh, make it look gabled. And it has a, a, a nice entrance, a, a, a prospect from the north side, or the ex, on the existing north side. It's just that <laughs> Highway 3 railroads, and it is tens of thousands of people uh, go by. Uh, we'll see the back side uh, uh, of, of the Tim Hortons, i.e. the drive-through window. Nonetheless, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'd appreciate all the work that's gone into them. Uh, this project so far, and uh, 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 wish it well, but that just being my concern, mostly I guess about the aesthetics of the north, uh, of the south uh, drive-through window side uh, being the side that faces the greater flow of people. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Moslin, and I see no further questions, gentlemen, and uh, you know that this will be on the agenda for the regular meeting tonight. So thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether you traveled to get here or you're zooming in, so be safe. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, council, we are moving on to the next item, which is the petition from motocross um, all of you have received it and I'm sure have reviewed it. Um, uh, Mr. Redfern will comment. Sure, so through your worship, um, this, this petition was completed and, and submitted to the city prior to the release of the resolutions. Um, two weeks ago, I guess, or a week and a half ago. And uh, so I have followed up with um, Steve, and I have let him know uh, what what the city's actions are moving forward. And, uh, and 
and so I'm not sure that it's still um, a concern or if they're, if they're actually satisfied with, with Council's actions in this area. So that's something we will have to follow up on. Okay, so you heard that clearly that uh, this matter uh, was prior to the decisions we took as Council over the last few meetings. So open up questions, comments on this. But again, uh, this is going forward to tonight's meeting in terms of any further action. No questions. All right, thank you, Council. Oh, just a moment, we have a question from the public. This is a committee of the whole meeting. Mr. Okay, Trump, so, yeah. not a hot. As a neighboring property owner, I will once again ask this question. Is the city prepared to implement a clearly defined fire mitigation plan for the MOTO site, including the, the perimeter fire break? This is a concern shared not only by myself, but the residents of Valley Heights, as well as other residents and property owners on the mountain. There is no question, uh, one second, there is no question that the site has been the host to numerous fires and that danger of wildfire during the dry season originating at the site is very high, not to mention compounded by the present and non-conforming use of the site. Thank you very much, and I'll pass this to Mr. Redfern here. I think that probably he's more in a position to answer that in terms of whether or not our directions have made uh, provision for that or um, identified that issue. Yeah, so through your worship, right now, um, and, and I'll check with George because I know this is probably about to change, but right now there's a fire ban on for the community. However, it's probably going to be lifted in the near future. Yes, that's correct. So there is a fire ban right now, and education has been a large part of our interaction up there, along with Council's uh, previous or current direction in limiting some of the growth in that area. It also has been uh, around fire awareness. I know that some of the groups have been working with the individuals up there as well. I don't know that we've had an issue um, with fires since we started taking that active educational response. I don't know, George, has there been any uncontrolled fires up there? Not recently. Yeah, so um, we're moving forward. I know we've talked to BC Wildfire, but at this point there is no plan to do any controlled burns or fire uh, uh, bridging in there, I guess. So Mr. DeHaan was asking for a fire break of some kind, um, but I understand what you're saying here at this point that if that's necessary in future, you would consider it, but the mitigation that you have in place uh, at this point um, addresses that issue as, as best we can? I guess, through your worship, yes. And, I, I mean, Dave was going to report out a little later, we have seen a decrease in, in the number of people that are actually staying in that area already. So, as we move forward and Council makes more decisions, I guess we'll have to gauge the risk and come up with a plan. Thank you. Council, further questions on this matter before we move on? I don't see any hands. Um, and at this point in time, there's no motion required as we did except the agenda. So moving down to items for uh, decisions and discussion, we don't have regional district here. Do we have uh, Mr. Russell here for anything from the RD? No, no. Not today. And um, I would probably give this to Councillor Korlick if she has any regional district comments to make at this point as our representative. Councillor Korlick, did you want to say anything? Yeah. I have some things on the RD stuff that basically was uh, based on COVID-19, the reopening of the facilities, and everything's being um, modified, uh, reopening use. And IHA province, uh, Works APC, all are involved. And um, the implication of cost to uh, open things, how the athletic center is going to open regarding the cost, staffing, and health. And there's hundreds of pages of information to go sit through. Something that's interesting is even at this point, if the pool, for example, was open, um, anybody 65 and older would be prohibited from using the pool facilities. Um, so they're looking for clarification on that because honestly, a lot of people 65 and older are more fit than those that are in their 40s and wherever. Plus, um, the rest are social and physical well-being happens in that pool. And to me, if it was going on maybe to uh, incorporate 
the older people would be to, to limit the amount of people participating in the program to have more hours offered rather than all in two hours. So that is, you know, it's, we live in a different area than, say, down in Vancouver, the lower mainland, where there's been so many outbreaks among the seniors, mostly in, in, in uh, healthcare homes. So I thought that was an interesting thing. That, Councilor Corla, can I can I clarify? Are are you clear that uh, 65 and over are going to be banned from using the the pool? All of them, all over the province, 65 and older are prohibited from using the pool facilities. Period. That sounds like age discrimination to me. I'm not sure that's going to. It may not wash. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. Thank you, yeah. Councilor Thompson. <laughs> yeah, it, well, I. I just think that's it's, that, I think that's not right because it's that is so many people social. That's where they go to socialize. That's where they go for their physical health and well-being. So I it's I, it's under question for everywhere. So yeah. Um, and it's very important to uh, regionally coordinate all reopening programs at, across the region and following, of course, our provincial guidelines. Um, the transit RFP is currently in the review process because we did have a number of people uh, submit um, application forms and whatnot. So that's under review. Um, the Trails Master Plan Design and Implement Survey is on the website. And there, it's all being developed so that we can go forward. Uh, the next. Um, Step in the Trails Master Plan is for public input. So that's all being developed and organized. And you know, the COVID is, is as we've gone through, it's changed so many things that slowed down some things and other things were able to get more clarification and work on programs. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, we did have an update from Community Futures, and this has also got to do with, I just wrapped in the um, RDKB report with the BCDC. So it's because it all works in the same kind of area here. Community Futures is um, working on startup plans for the economic development and focus on local outreach for local business. And they're working very um, tightly with the chamber. And I think that's good because that's, they have their fingers on the pulse of the community. And so um, Community Futures is building a portal to filter government information. So just so it all goes through one area and it's, it's made to be developed into information that can be understood by people, not just all this, you know, all the words that mean nothing to some people. So they're really kind of trying to figure it out and make it understandable to all. So they're also working on marketing support for launch of videos on Christina Lake and Grand Forks. So I think that's all moving forward and I think it's really important. And um, we will, we're getting there. And we've had several conversations on um, the housing needs survey. Well, it's also on the RGKB website, so we can uh, go in and respond to that, and it's coming up. So we're, we're trying to get that together, too. And um, it's all, well, again, the past month or so, it's all been a long time COVID. And lately, um, the flooding, and you'll see everybody's minds have been so all over with all these local things going on. It's been a, in an interesting time. I think we're working through everything and moving forward. And, and I really want to thank everyone for this opportunity to uh, sit on the RDKD board because it is a totally, a, quite a different perspective to things from just from the city. It is a huge overview on the, what's going on and I think that's certainly um, educational for me and I really appreciate that opportunity. So uh, thank you. I think that's just about it right now. Thank yeah. you, Councillor Korlick, and Councillor Zelinsky waiting. Uh, yeah, Kathy, um, or Councillor Korlick, a couple questions. Uh, <coughs> first of all, the um, housing report, any concern that with COVID and not having the open houses and things, are, are we going to get a, a report that we can report with? 
I think I think you're going to see that there will be the um, online survey, yes, to begin with, and you're going to see more interaction with community people as as they work through the COVID reopening and being able to do group communications. Okay, and the only other thing, promotion, the only other thing I have is any news on the land in, inventory uh, project that the teachers were working on. It is still being worked on. <laughs> That's all I can say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Korlick. Um, and moving down to presentations from staff, um, we have the issue of the Senior Center and uh, our um, ongoing efforts to deal with that issue. Um, I see that um, we have uh, staff here to address it, and I'll start open with Duncan. Sure. So through your worship, uh, I think Dave has done an excellent job in, in kind of pulling everything together. I wasn't here for that first discussion, and so it's been a bit of a, a learning opportunity for me as well to understand how, how this came about and some of the history there. Essentially, Council's resolution was for Dave to look at all of these different options. Well, you know, Dave has looked at everything and, and, and really is some really accurate costing and, and really we're at a point now um, where where council can make a decision as to how we move forward and Dave has mapped out, you know, at the very end he's kind of mapped out four four different avenues obviously with varying degrees of cost to the city and and um, you know also some would be a little different than the, the previous model that we operated on. From there, Dave, do you have any other comments you want to jump in on? Uh, just, just a few uh, things. Duncan, uh, through the mayor. Um, well, yeah, there's, there's four kind of different options, which, are, which I think we've kind of concluded need to be considered by council, but all four of those options bring vastly different conclusions. Uh, the now, long and short of it is, and certainly the Coles Notes version, is it appears the most appropriate replacement facility at this time would be a prefabricated modular uh, component which could be used for a period of years. Certainly could be used primarily for the seniors, but could be used for many other user groups as well. Maybe a very much a similar relationship to what previously existed. However, obviously, in a new facility, in a location as yet to be determined, uh, there's a number of different options, but before we even start looking at location options, I think, you know, the, the, the decision needs to be made, uh, should we proceed in that direction. Now, of course, that's, a, the, that, that's the concrete solution, that that's a physical solution to certainly what the seniors have been asking. Uh, the other three options which are available uh, are, are uh, uh, essentially funding options. Uh, 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 in fact, there, there's two considerably different funding arrangements which council might consider, but it would be up to the seniors to, to really investigate uh, what, what facility may be available and how best to go about it. Uh, and the fourth option, of course, is if neither of these particular options uh, seem to work for you, well, uh, the only thing I can suggest is we wait until some other undetermined option comes to the table and consider that to in due course. Uh, obviously, that doesn't resolve the issue anytime soon, though. But that's pretty much all I have to offer at this time, but certainly if there's any questions. Yes, and I, I think that we've determined that uh, our inaction here would continue to um, hurt the seniors in terms of their um, numbers and everything else. So we have a responsibility basically to bring this to a head uh, and that we've done all we can in our efforts to find some arrangement here, but it is back to them in terms of um, where they want to go with this. Uh, I have two sets of questions. Councillor uh, Thompson first, then Councillor Moslin. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of questions, Dave. Um, will the insurance that was what we received on the, down, the destruction of that facility, will that cover the cost of um, a new facility 
um, without consideration of land? Uh, that's a very good question, Councillor. Um, uh, through the mayor, it, it, it'll be closed. However, we do have to consider that the proceeds uh, that, that we've received uh, from uh, our insurers uh, uh, need to go towards the demolition of the existing facility as well. And based on previous demolitions of commercial buildings of that nature around town, I'd estimate it could be as, as much as $50,000. So obviously that's going to chew into the proceeds that we receive specifically for that facility. And I guess at the end of the day, we really won't know until uh, we, we do some deeper analysis. The, 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 be, the best I can offer at this time from a uh, manufacturing company is the units themselves for uh, approximately 2,400 square feet of essentially open space with maybe, well, not maybe, but uh, with some washrooms, possibly storage rooms not including the kitchen, and certainly not including land, that's a very good question, uh, will be in the neighborhood of $200,000, probably just north of $200,000, which puts us into that funding window. However, uh, I, always, I always get real cautious when we're doing something like that in Grand Forks. Well, while that may be the, uh, the ideal uh, amount, uh, there will be an engineering component that's necessary. There will be other expenses with, which come up, and I, I, I dare say we're, we're looking, you know, at, at three hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars, almost for sure, which puts us over uh, uh, that funding uh, uh, component that, that, that we've received. And so, Sir Your Worship, to, to circle back. Right now, you know, staff is essentially done and, and kind of weighed out each of the options. So right now, we need to know how council wants to proceed. If, if council decides we want to spend the proceeds from insurance and, and we want to purchase a building or, or place a building, we have a general idea of what those costs are. We can go through and, and put together and finalize that plan to do that. We just need some confirmation from council as far as what do we want to do? Where do you where do you want to uh, where does this fit within your priorities and, and how far do you want to, to move forward? The other options within the report are providing a fee for service similar to other groups, you know, or providing lump sums. There's lots of different avenues, and you have a good idea of what each of those are going to cost now, essentially. All right, thank you, and Councillor Moslin. Well, I have one more question. I'm sorry, Councillor Johnson. Um, is are the seniors looking for? Uh, facility for their exclusive use as they did with the building in uh, State Park that they could rent out as a uh, means of uh, fundraising? Yeah, if, if, if I could, through the mayor, the, my understanding is the, the previous arrangement that the seniors had wasn't exclusive uh, for the seniors, although the seniors were the for lack of a better term, the, the primary key holder of the facility. Any other community organization, should they uh, require that space, including the municipality, I recall using that for public open houses on a number of occasions, <coughs> that space needs to be made available. And uh, while they may be, may be the primary uh, uh, user group for this facility, uh, and their uh, uh, tables and chairs and, uh, and various other components may be stored there. Uh, that they would, I, I suspect, wish for the same arrangement they previously had, which was the ability to, uh, to at least out short term for, for other events for, uh, for financial purposes so that they could pay the utilities and pay the ongoing maintenance costs even possibly do some upgrades such as what they did in the previous facility. I agree. I think that is their intention. Councillor Thompson, anything further? No, I think that um, that answers my my questions. Thank you. Councillor Moslin first and then Councillor Corlick. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, David, uh, for, for the presentation. I'm trying to sift through this with the seniors. I guess, uh, you know, at one time all this money, we thought, well, it'll go to the community center. Uh, 
maybe. But uh, uh, I, I, a couple of options that seem to have gone from the table. The library basement, uh, we not only got funding for repairs to the library basement, we got, you know, also got funding for this uh, building in City Park. So basically, um, you, Mr. Bruce, did you look into the library basement? Was that one of your considerations that we should take uh, insurance from both uh, settlements for both the lot damage to the library basement originally, as well as the senior center, and turned it into uh, a, a senior center? That's my first question. Was there any consideration for the library basement? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Councillor, through the mayor. Um, uh, two things that immediately come to mind. First off, the seniors, in fact, weren't really thrilled uh, with that particular location uh, in that it is a basement. It is, uh, it doesn't have external illumination. Now, there, there's some, some other building consequences too, such as installing uh, any kind of uh, kitchen component, uh, the ventilation of certain exhaust features and other mechanical, uh, mechanical stuff that has to be done. In addition to that, Councillor, uh, substantial work would be required in the rear parking lot and to the south side of that building for barrier-free access. And, and while most certainly uh, that, that is an option and has been looked at, uh, uh, certainly my conclusion was at the end of the day, the amount of effort to, uh, to deal with that particular space at this time uh, would not uh, would, would, would not be the best solution in light of the uh, in, in, in light of the less time that it would take to get a pre-manufactured uh, solution available. Uh, so uh, yeah, unfortunately the the, the ground floor the, the basement of the library was looked at, but it, it was certainly ruled out. I do you think we have to keep in mind too that one of the, of the benefits of the, the prefabricated version for this facility is, is that it is an interim uh, solution, it could be a few years obviously, uh, until such a time as a permanent solution uh, is found, uh, at which time this particular 2400 square feet or whatever it turns out uh, could be repurposed for other municipal uh, uses in other potential spaces. Uh, your question about funding is interesting too. I mean, if it is a question of utilizing, I don't know, uh, not just the insurance proceeds from the damaged facility in City Park, but insurance proceeds from other damaged facilities and coupling them together, well, I think it, you know, it, it, it follows that, that possibly the insurance proceeds from the library and the insurance proceeds from the previous uh, uh, city park facility could be combined for for this particular modular use. And clearly, uh, once uh, they've uh, toured that building, they uh, seniors didn't show any interest. So that was another factor in terms of moving forward with any further analysis of the cost. That, that, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey. Thank you. And. Uh, Councillor Corley, can we wait to hear from, oh, Councillor Moslin, did you want to follow up? Follow up from Councillor Moslin. The other one I wanted to touch on was the flood proofing. Mm -hmm. That is the existing building. You wrote, Mr. Bruce, in your report, uh, the other flood damage structure which can be considered as the previous city owned seniors facility in Sydney Park. You go on to say it is possible to flood proof it. But then you say in your last sentence, however, particularly after the last few weeks of flooding concerns, this does not appear to be an option at any cost. You know, I, 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 if we were looking for expedience, and that's sort of what you say in the modular homes, that maybe it might be just as expedient to uh, 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 repair and flood proof that building. It did not flood this year. We are again. We are hoping that we are becoming more adept at flood proofing our city, and the freshet of 2020 <coughs> certainly demonstrated that. That perhaps we should be looking more seriously 
uh, flood proofing of that building, uh, 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 returning it to the seniors. In other words, that, my question is, why after the, this, the last freshet do we exclude that entirely? Thank you, Mayor. That's my follow-up. Go ahead, Mr. Bruce. Uh, if I could, Town Speaker, through the Mayor, uh, maybe, maybe just call me uh, a little bit nervous, but, but certainly the, the few days uh, a week or so ago where it most certainly appeared as though that building was going to experience just as much, if not more, uh, uh, water damage kind of it kind of made me put that in the back burner. It is entirely possible. I have spoken to an engineer about it. And in fact, it's, it's not, it, it, I, I don't want to exclude that option. Uh, and we don't necessarily have to exclude that option, quite frankly. If, if we're prepared to look at a facility, as opposed to a funding arrangement, but at a facility, uh, I don't see why, at the same time, whatever consultant is determined the, the, that we need uh, can also review that and maybe provide us with those two costs. Uh, one thought did occur to me though as well, and that is, well, let's just do nothing to it. But let's just, it is what it is. All we have to do is tear the old edition off, the, the previous kitchen edition, and repair it like everyone else has repaired flood damaged buildings. However, I do think we're gonna run into some insurance difficulties uh, simply by repairing that building and utilizing it, crossing our fingers every spring that, that, that it doesn't flood again. Um, so, uh, it, while it, it, it is an option, it just seems to be a real stretch, and I believe that's why I kind of concluded in my report, particularly in light of the last few days, uh, probably just doesn't seem to be a real good option. All right, thank you. And so I'll jump in, sorry, through your worship with Dave. I mean, Dave's proposed an option that will ensure, essentially, that you're not going to have contents damage or additional damage. We can do everything we can. I, I don't believe, and again, I wasn't here in 2018. You probably never thought the water would, would get that high, and we don't know, you know, we don't know what the future brings. So as we plan this, you know, as opposed to that risk every spring, uh, no matter what we do to the building, access, etc., Dave's proposed something that takes it completely out of that area and puts it on the other side of the dikes. All right, thank you. And moving on, Councillor Korlick and then Councillor uh, Zelinsky. Okay, just a quick question. Where will we put these modulars? Where's the land? I, I believe, if I could, through the mayor, through the mayor I believe that's a, a good question, quite frankly, for another day. I do have three or four very viable municipally owned properties where this could be located. Uh, however, I want to get over the should we go down that path first before we start looking at uh, the, the, the potential solutions, all of which have their benefits and all of which have their uh, negatives. So, um, so, so if I could, I, I would like to just, just simply say stay tuned. Right, and that there are available properties, but it's too early at this point in the process. So we have to decide, or have to be decided, what, what kind of facility is going to be used, whether it's a modular or... Okay, okay so we have some decisions to make. Okay, uh, Mr. Duncan, before Councillor Zielinski. So yeah, just to, to clarify, Councillor Corlett, I guess the first question is, to what extent does the city want to be involved? Do you do you want to construct or purchase a facility and lease it out to the seniors, or is there a different model that you want to engage in? And then if council decides that you want to construct or bring in a, a prefab facility, then we can really iron out those details. But right now, Dave, and, and this is partly myself trying to streamline and understand exactly what council wants, has been looking at all options and unable to dig into some real hard detail into each of them. We really need to know what extent council wants to be involved. That's the really first decision point of council. And you have a lot of information about some of those other opportunities that are out there. And, and then we would bring back that refined information. As far as staff reports go, 
we're kind of at a wall now where we need a decision from council. I agree. And uh, Councillor Zielinski has been very patient waiting. Councillor Korduk, you kept your hand up. Did you have a follow-up? Not, you're muted, Councillor. No, she's good. Okay, Councillor Zielinski, waiting patiently. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess, uh, well, first question uh, for, for staff for Dave, uh, whether or not the seniors saw your report uh, other than the agenda package for today. Uh, no, uh, to, to the mayor, I did not uh, provide them with a draft version, although I did have a discussion uh, with uh, the president of the Senior Society uh, on the phone prior to the report uh, being published in the agenda, and I did brief them on the, the four particular options we were looking at, and, and uh, I had... Um, I mean, the, the conclusion is what the conclusion is, and, and he was comfortable with that. I, I guess where I'm at is um, uh, get the group in and let's have a discussion and see, you know, have their input on the report, on the options, and see which way they want to go. Uh, but I do have another, on the city park issue and whatnot, if there was a flood-proof structure put there, does anybody know how high out of the ground it would have to be? Uh, to sit on city park land again. Basically, where the, where the old one is, if we rebuilt in the same location, how high would that building have to be out of the ground to uh, use it? Yeah, okay. yeah, I think Graham's working on that floodplain, and I think Dave, you're involved in that as well, the floodplain bylaw that indicates those those build heights. Yeah, if, if I could say, though, through the mayor, the, the height of the water you saw last time is approximately four feet above the existing slab, if that puts in, into perspective for it, Councillor. Okay, and, and for my two cents worth, I'm, I'm not willing to touch the old building. Building, I, I think it has to be ripped down, because I know there were issues before the flood and after the flood on uh, uh, the, the sewer service and uh, dirt slumping and whatnot, and there's more, more problems under there than I think we hold, so. Yes, sir, wise. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, Councillor Zielinski, in my discussions with the seniors, as I, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the four particular conclusion points, it's very clear what their, what, 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 what their, what, what their preferred option is, and that is to provide a facility at the earliest possible opportunity. Um, other funding arrangements are great, but I, I should add that uh, the previous funding request that was on the table for uh, the old Hardy View Lodge uh, is apparently now off the table uh, once again, so that doesn't appear to be an option. Any other potential location that, that they could that they could consider, they already would have considered it, and we. we We've, we've received nothing from them, so. So this, in, in sense, puts the ball back in their court. They know what you've written in your report summarizes the efforts that we've made, but they need to make some choices and come forward to us no, at I, this point. I don't believe so, Mr. Mayor. I think the choices are, you know, are, are we going to get in the building game for a community, uh, albeit portable and temporary center? Or is it going to be a funding arrangement for the seniors specifically to find their own location? Can you put that in the form of a motion? <laughs> yeah, we can work on something for the meeting. Okay, and uh, I hear uh, Mr. Redfern saying that that can be framed so that we can establish our position on these issues. Councillor Zielinski. Yeah, just a follow-up, uh, a comment that you made, uh, Mr. Bruce, is that um, 2,400 square feet being temporary and when the seniors find a permanent site, that being vacated. Any reason why that comment? Because I, at 2,400 square feet, if they're in there, I think they're in there for, for life. I think so. Um, can you explain that comment? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, through the mayor, um, the particular modules I was actually sourcing were, I'm going to use the word repurpose, they were 
They're not brand new. They're not off the factory floor. Uh, they're not something which I would think should be the, well, at, at that particular price, uh, should be considered a permanent solution. Um, to repurpose these in smaller components, I think each one was about 600 square feet. If you do 600 square feet here, 600 square feet there, you can you cobble them all together if you wish, but uh, uh, at, at the end of the day, um, I, I sure hope this would not be a, a, you know, a long, long term solution. Something else is, is expected to uh, come up. Okay, so Councillor Thompson is waiting. Are we, are we ready to say that we would be prepared to commit property if they went the direction of a modular approach. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Um, have, have, I, I believe there's been discussion with the Slavonics with respect to their facility um, on 72nd. Um, would they be willing to, um, could the city purchase that? building um, and have it used for all groups. Mr. Redfern. So, so through your worship, that's a, that's a great question, Councillor Thompson. I, I think right now there's a lot of different kind of rabbit holes that we can get into and, and even some direction along the lines of saying we want to own a piece of infrastructure that, that we're going to rent out would give us some more direction to look at that. And I know there's been some discussion with the Slavonic seniors, I believe, Dave, just around the use and blended use, I think it was at one point. Yes, yes, yes but uh, for the mayor, uh, didn't pan out, right? No, those discussions are not yeah. particularly well. So so great option, Councillor Thompson, in an effort to try to, to try to keep us moving and, and actually to understand exactly what council wants. I guess the first question is do you want to get into a building? Is that is that council's uh, direction moving forward is that we want to own and provide a building to this group and then we can really dig into it and, and bring some land options and really hammer that out. Councillor Moslin has his hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, thank you for the discussion once again of all these alternatives. I, I do want to make it clear that I would support uh, a fee-for-service arrangement that I, I'm looking at a deficit of need here that's really large. That this COVID pandemic has really revealed the weaknesses in our social fabric around seniors. We are going to need to invest somewhere, somehow, in this population to help them recover. You know, this, the COVID pandemic along with the tragedy of the flood of 2018 has really weakened our uh, social fabric for our seniors. And uh, so I am in favor of, uh, if you're looking for that, you want to build it around, uh, a, a fee-for-service arrangement uh, of some sort, uh, perhaps not on the equivalency that we have a fee-for-service arrangement with the BMS or the gallery, but something. Uh, and that with that fee for service arrangement, that the seniors themselves help uh, apply that uh, uh, to a housing solution, whether it be a temporary one at this point uh, that would transform in the years ahead to a more permanent solution or location. But nonetheless, I do want to make it clear that I would support uh, a fee for service arrangement with this group, uh, you know, uh, on the understanding that we would negotiate what services uh, 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 they would provide. Mr. Yeah. Redfern, then before we talk to Councillor Zelensky. So just a clarification, Councillor Moslem, when you refer to a fee for service, does that include providing a space? Because I think how it was written in the report, a fee for service would provide funding for them to rent or lease from somebody else. That's how it was written in the report. So just a clarification of the that would be my, Yes, thank you, Mr. Redford, for the clarification question. Yes, 
Uh, I, I would just keep it simple on our part. You were looking where are we? Do we want to get involved? My answer is yes. Uh, the simplest way we can get involved, perhaps the most immediate, is to simply negotiate a fee for service arrangement so that they can be uh, uh, knowing that they have a uh, you know an income resource, they can go negotiate a, a secure location that's appropriate. Uh, I'm I'm not really I, I I'm not, not I, I would like to develop on a permanent basis civic infrastructure. I still have the library basement staring at us unused. Uh, uh, we still have lots of city property along Riverside that might become a permanent solution in the future. Uh, we, you know we do have other uh, potential senior developments. A solution may present itself in the future, uh, but uh, if you're looking for, are, are we committed? This councillor said yes. Uh, I would be willing to come up with some sort of fee for service arrangement. Councillor Zelinsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, so I don't know if we fleshed out the fee for service model. I guess, uh, I, and I don't think the, the seniors have commented on that. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. I guess. So, what I would uh, request is that we get a list of what organizations we are doing that with, whether the buildings included and the amount plus, just so you know, hopefully we're treating everybody the same. So when we have that discussion, yeah, that's that would be great. Thank you. And Councillor uh, Studley and then Councillor Johnson. Hey, yes, I just like all the talk of your service. I just that a while ago and it kind of got shut down, so I hope to see that back on the table. Okay, Councillor Johnson. Oh, yeah, um, are we, are, are staff looking for a recommendation from Council today? I think uh, staff is looking for us to help frame a motion that uh, Duncan is working on that would bring this uh, to a head for us. Could, could I ask uh, staff then to put up the um, options that were included in, um, in if, the uh, Dave Bruce's the four options? Yeah. Okay, they're up. So do we want to just maybe quickly go through each one, the pros and cons, and then come to a, a formulator a resolution? We've kind of touched on all of them, but I'll open that. We, we also can clarify. We can clarify. We also have uh, 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 something from the public. So. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, <clears throat> so I have a couple of comments here I've been asked to pass on. Carol Rangson, I'm sorry, Carol, I'm not sure if that's the way you pronounce your last name, but council is really letting the seniors down. Spend more time on them and less on the vagrants. Shame on council, that's her comment. Uh, Thomas Lockwood, what a farce. My question, here, to Mr. Bruce, here. I'm just curious. Um, you're talking about modulars, uh, basically cobbling together a couple of 600 square foot modulars to make a 2400 square foot. Uh, I'm not a, even though I could be a member because of my age, I'm not a member of the senior center, but I'm kind of invested in the community having events and having venues to have events in. I'm not sure what that's going to look like now in post-COVID times, but <clears throat> That was one of the facilities that had, it was a venue that lots of people and lots of groups had events at. And I'm wondering, in a 2,400 square foot total space made of 600 square foot modules, is there gonna be any room to have any events at all? So should we get to the point where we can have 50 people in the room? Uh, my understanding to the mayor is uh, the previous facility was in the neighborhood of 2,400 square feet. <coughs> So presumably the space that was sufficient previously, and and, and that's sort of that kitchen space, quite frankly. So right. it's right. The, the actual hall area was, I think, eighteen hundred square feet, but then there's washrooms and stuff. So uh, the the size is it, it would be similar to, to what we previously saw, and the the, the reason I'm saying modular as opposed to 
big built permanent construction that's going to be there for a hundred years as a public assembly place is first off speed I and mean, this can be done within a matter of months uh, the, the second off is is most certainly expense and third um, is the the very real possibility of a permanent solution uh, uh, such as uh, the Grand Forks community development that was on the on the table a few months ago uh, the, the, that could actually be seen within a 10-year period so um, I guess so, what, so that's that, that's why I'm trying yeah, to go down that, that the, path yeah the general gist of what I was trying to get at though is mm -hmm. is uh, yeah the the existing facility I it had a room and a single room space that was probably somewhere around 1200 square feet and I'm wondering if you're cobbling together a couple of 600 square foot modules, will there be a, an equivalent large space or will it be broken up into smaller rooms that you go through doorways to get into because that's not really a venue? Uh, that that's a very good question. It would be, for all intents and purposes, a large open space. However, in fairness, there will be a few columns yeah, okay. scattered about internally, yeah. which tables will have to be arranged for. Sure. But, but yeah, for all intents and purposes, an open space. Yeah. Yeah. So to answer that also, Les, I've, I've, been, in, I've been in some of the work camp uh, common areas, and they're huge spaces that are cobbled together modular units where they typically do eating and you can as a member of public enter and also order a meal there as well. There are large open spaces, however structurally they do have to have some supports in various locations. You want to have square dances, you've got a square dance is not corner dance, it's in yeah. room. Understandable. And and council hasn't committed to any of this yet, right? We're still working yeah. our way through understanding now which which area are we really gonna refine our focus and come back with some real detail for council. Right. Okay, Councillor Thompson. You're muted. Okay. Um, I would put forward a resolution that uh, council follows option one. Which is to request staff to secure the services of a professional consultant, the cost of which is to be afforded through the insurance proceeds from the flood damage civic facility in City Park to produce a design of tender documents and to invite quotations for the complete installation of a prefabricated modular 2400 square foot approximately all-purpose civic facility complete with engineering and all site setup components to suit building code requirements the location of which is to be determined by council at a later date. Okay, councillor, um, this is a uh, committee of the whole. We don't need a seconder for that, and I open it up to further discussion. Mr. Redfern, you look like you're... No, I, uh, again, all we would commit to is, you know, just to caveat this, you know, before we proceeded too far, obviously we'd want council to, to see exactly what that looks like and providing that information along the path. So. If this is the direction council goes, we want to make sure you understand that, you know, you're not signing that check today. There'll be some additional information that comes to council as we dig into it and get, you know, some description regarding locations and exactly what that might look like. But it's a firm commitment yep. to a professional consultant Correct. to move this forward. Yep, next steps. Oh. Right, council understands that, so we're taking money from the insurance settlement to move this forward with some plans. Further comments? I don't see. Yeah, yeah Councillor Thompson. There was another hand up. Oh. Um, Did we miss anyone? Kevin has to scroll some. Um, Councillor Zelinsky. Okay, um, Councillor Zelinsky. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm I'm not that far down the road yet. Um, mainly because probably I haven't had conversations as. Uh, staff have with the seniors. Um, maybe 2,400 square feet isn't going to do it for them. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm more at number, uh, sort of a reworked number, motion number two, which reads, I uh, invite the senior society representatives to a future council meeting, period. 
that's that's sort of where where I am is more on the middle. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I I can't support number one right now. If we do go with number one, I would suggest that we put in where the money is actually coming from. So mention that it is coming from the insurance settlement. But uh, yeah, I I'm not there yet. Sorry. And I just put that on the table to generate some discussion. I'm quite prepared to withdraw that motion if, Councillor Zelensky, you want to put forward uh, option two. Uh, well, well, let's hear what other people think about option one, I guess. Let's, let's start there, and uh, yeah, I'm prepared to do that if we have be. Okay, I don't see any further hands up. Am I missing something? There. Councillor Moslin has his hand up. Councillor Moslin. Yeah, th thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillors Thompson and Zelensky, uh, for putting this back uh, in front of us again. Uh, you know, at, at this point, I, 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 I want to reiterate that I want to do something. Uh, that I feel that this population is is at risk uh, that, and are worth investing in. Okay, having said that, how do we go about it? Uh, you know, at this point, I'm not too sure what motion's actually on the uh, 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 table. Councillor Thompson removed her motion, and so we're uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, choice number two being proposed by Councillor Zielinski. Hey, can I just, if, if, with Councillor Zielinski's permission, uh, I know that he wants, I love short motions, right? but I, here's my suggestion to lengthen it. I invite the senior society representative to a future council meeting uh, to discuss a fee for service arrangement, I, I, I you know, I, I want to. Uh, so that would be my extent, not just to come to a future council meeting, which they sort of have done already, but to to start to discuss a fee for service arrangement. Leaving um, the issue of physical building out of the discussion. Well, you know, let's let yeah. Well, basically. The intent is we are going to give you money. What do you want to do with it? Uh, you know, uh, uh, again, we we need we do need them to be at the table, uh, uh, not just to, to hammer out this deal, but how probably to maybe help them expand their sites as seniors are going to need more resources and more services. Um, anyhow, so that just my intent. I don't know if Councillor Zelensky would uh, do that. It also would signal to uh, staff that if if we adopted this motion, that we are willing uh, to spend money uh, uh, for how much and for what you know is to be decided. But the intent is we are willing to spend uh, uh, money to. Uh, uh, secure our services or help to secure services uh, for this population. Okay. Now, that's my so just to, to clarify my understanding then, that we would invite them to a meeting where on the table would be us basically providing a structure that we would then lease to them and it would be a civic facility run by the seniors similar to what we were doing at the park? No. Sorry, sorry, Mayor, that wasn't my intention. My, my intention was to leave it even more open than that. Well, to come to a meeting and talk about a fee for service. Uh, that, 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 you know, part may, maybe that might involve managing civic infrastructure somewhere, uh, or maybe it won't. That man, you know, a fee for service arrangement, you know, much like we provide. Uh, you know, as Councillor Zelensky's question to the Boundary Museum Society representative, uh, that the structures they inhabit are owned by a third party, uh, or owned by a third party. So, you know, that, that's quite possible that maybe seniors could come to a similar arrangement. Anyhow, my intent is just to leave it really open. Uh, it doesn't have to center around the building, at least not at this point of the discussion. Okay, that's and. Uh, Mr. Redfern, did you want to comment before we go to Councillor Corlick? No, I, I mean, just briefly to your worship, I guess, yes. Uh, and, and just in your previous comments, Councillor Muslim, that I had written down is, is when you had talked about fee-for-service, 
you had talked about providing funding and letting the group negotiate the location, but it sounds like your intent now from your clarification is to essentially leave everything on the table, invite them in to see what they would like to do. But commitment that there will be some funding of some sort. Okay. Um, Councillor Korlick. Well, I think it's really important to involve them in any decisions going forth because they're desperate and looking for something. And it's really important to me to see the seniors housed in some some way that they will be able to uh, pursue their um, social activities and whatever it is. Um, I support number two. And I, yeah, I support this second. Okay. Um, Council, have we, uh, have we done this one? So what we're saying is number two is what we'd like to proceed with at this point. Um, the motion is on the table by Councillor Zielinski. Doesn't need a seconder, but it would move it forward in terms of giving instructions to staff. So question, all those in favor? Opposed? I see no opposition and so I hope that helps, Mr. Redfern. So it is, it's a modified option too, essentially. So yes, we could, yes. It will come back to the regular meeting and we'll clarify when you vote on it in the regular meeting. But it, essentially what we've heard through your worship is council would like to invite the seniors in and, and ask them how they'd like to proceed. Right, as simple as that. Thank you, council. All right, we're moving on in the agenda. And uh, the next item of business are the uh, department manager's monthly reports and so I will open that up to Mr. Redfern in terms of the monthly reports and anything directly from staff. Sure and, and so through your worship I, I think maybe how we'll approach it there's been a lot of discussion a lot of delegations this morning and, and councils moved through this committee whole. while we have Dave up here I guess I would ask if there's any questions for Dave and then maybe we'll let Dave uh, excuse himself as I know he's got some stuff he's working on. So, any questions for Dave regarding the monthly report? Opening it up, council questions for building department. Bylaws. What are you called now, Dave? Everything. Bylaws. <laughs> B and B. B and B. Questions, Councillor Moslin. Yeah. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, sorry, Mr. Busan. You're having trouble figuring out what screen I can move. Uh, in your report, uh, uh, Mr. Bruce, you wrote uh, about attending a meeting at the request of the Downtown Business Association regarding business concerns and how enhanced security and bylaw presence might be beneficial to the members. Bylaw services will become more visible despite not having many bylaws which control the behaviors in question. So my question is, Mr. Bruce, what behaviors are we talking about and what kind of bylaws would be needed? Thank you. And I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. No, we, can, we'll, <laughs> we have a plan. Uh, <laughs> to, 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 through the mayor. Oh, thanks, Councillor. A uh, very good question. Actually, the Downtown Business Association had the same question. The, 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 the particular problems which are uh, a very visible downtown and, and the problems which the business community seems to be most concerned about are quite frankly social uh, considerations or social behavior questions or uh, the drug use for that matter there's there's other things which this municipality uh, does not have bylaws for we, we, we don't have bylaws essentially for criminal activity or even trespassing for that matter and we're not alone most most municipalities are like that the only real bylaw that, that I can think is is entirely applicable downtown is the anti-smoking and vaping bylaw that, that we currently have, <coughs> and and as such, uh, uh, I would like to think that well, sorry, not as so much like to think, I would uh, agree with the Downtown Business Association. That we should, as bylaw enforcement officers, myself and Lee, for uh, be more visible and be more present downtown, uh, and uh, continue on the path, of posting signs to that effect and, and other mechanisms to 
uh, try and deal with what social behaviors uh, we can deal with. In addition to that, though, there has been a considerable uh, discussion and request from uh, the provincial health minister, actually, regarding uh, by law enforcement uh, uh, visibility uh, during this pandemic situation, and uh, and should any questions arise regarding occupant load and spatial distancing, that kind of stuff, uh, that their hope is that the municipal by law enforcement officers might be the first point of contact for educational purposes, certainly not enforcement purposes. Uh, so uh, to that end, uh, we will be more visible, uh, particularly on Market Street and other businesses, uh, clearly indicating that we are a municipal bylaw uh, service department. <coughs> and uh, and what, what bylaws we do have uh, that, uh, that can assist the Downtown Business Association, we will most certainly uh, uh, implement. Uh, and uh, or enforce for that matter and whatever assistance we can provide the uh, uh, provincial ministry of health uh, we would like to think that we'd be a, uh, we would support that as well so that, that, that's what I mean by that and Dave something that, that the department your work is working on right now is some overarching statements around bylaw enforcement in a policy regarding what level of bylaw enforcement we provide there's a lot of different models and your resources kind of reflect those models um, you know there's reactive models there's neighborhood standards in, in that if my neighbors aren't worried about tall grass then should the city be worried about tall grass there's a number of uh, different approaches and we're working our way through an overarching policy which will then spin off into our MTI and, and fines and it'll establish how we enforce our bylaws and then we'll enforce the bylaws in the level to which uh, those fines will react or interact. So that's sneak peek into what you can see in the maybe the next meeting. Hopefully, yes. Further questions uh, at this point on the management reports and uh, in particular to uh, Mr. Bruce. I don't see any hands up. I'm not seeing the whole group here, but uh, looks like everybody's happy. On further items, then, uh, if we nice can uh, allow Mr. Bruce to leave. Thank you. Further questions on the reports? Can I have a motion to accept the management reports? Councillor Zielinski. Councillor Zielinski has a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'll just run down the list of uh, things. Uh, 19 new 19 new water meters um, is that because they failed or why would they change we'll just bring morris up here so you can hear uh, yes welcome morris there um what was the question on the amount of meters uh, the yeah the 19 meter uh, water meters have that were changed was it because they were faulty were they on warranty uh, blood damage um, new connects uh, there are some of them are the new meters are with the water meter program some are uh, replaced meters um, and none of them were to do with the flood so it's basically uh, new meters that were are to be installed under the program and some are replaced with meters. Okay, so, so if I got that right, um, 19 places are now being metered that weren't. Do we have a lot more that aren't being metered? Um, from my understanding, uh, the majority of these meters are new meters that have been installed under the meter program. Okay. Further, Councillor Ma Councillor Zelensky. Uh, yeah, an update on our OCP. Uh, how are we doing with the um, request for proposals and how far along are we in getting that document done? Mr. Redfern. That's your worship. Uh, Dee Dee and Justin, I think Justin, we're working our way through the RFP right now. First steps in the OCP, we've kind of mapped it out and, and so we, we were talking about coming back to council on a workshop, however, have, have turned our mind to the fact that we're going to have to hire somebody to come in 
Again, we really want to soak out of the council exactly what you're looking for in this OCP update, a complete rewrite zoning, and so we need to hire somebody in order to come in and have that initial conversation. Dee and I even talked about maybe even bringing in somebody independent first to figure out exactly what this OCP update looks like, and then going out to RFP. So it's not out there. Uh, we got a little railroaded uh, with some other items, but it's back number one priority moving forward. Okay. okay. The, only, the only other thing that I have is um, I think it's going on three or four years. A business license uh, bylaw uh, review. It, are we ever going to get that done and off, off our list of two? So, Mr. Redford. Yeah, through your worship, I again, I've gone through the task list and I'll have to go back because I don't remember seeing it on the task list. Was it one of the strap priorities, Councillor, or where did that come forward just to help? No, I, I, I think it actually came up uh, in the previous council at one time as far as a review of the business licensing. I believe uh, and Councillor Corlick or uh, Thompson can help me with this as far as it started with the um, uh, a regional business license type thing and then everything sort of got reviewed. But I, I do notice that it's been on here for quite, quite a long time. Councillor Thompson has her hand up, but uh, Daniel. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, so from my recollection in dealing with this, um, this this was an ask from our uh, one of our past CAOs to update the um, business licensing bylaw. It got handed from staff person to staff person over the years, uh, partially finance at one point, I believe. Uh, one our controller was involved with it. It, it ended up on, that, uh, on the corporate side, it ended up in, in planning and engineering at one point. Uh, the regional uh, business license part is in place now, at least uh, for a one year trial version. Um, we also got a copy of the bylaw that um, for business licensing, I believe that Greenwood put in place rather recently, which is pretty up to date. So uh, progress has been made on this, it's just not been pushed to the very forefront yet. Okay, Councillor Zelensky, any further? Councillor Thompson is waiting. No, thank you. Thank you. And just very quickly, if Duncan, maybe you can answer this. Um, has uh, there been new um, uh, RVs and uh, construction up at the model? Has, has that been looked into at all? You bet. So through your worship, um, what I can say is there has been a reduction in the number of RVs up in that area since Council has passed their motion. In particular, it's been uh, licensed RVs or trailers that were in the area and more in the parking lot. Uh, there's also been one trailer that was in within the moto camp itself that is now gone. And there has been over the weekend and over the last week, and I'm hoping maybe the delegation in the regular meeting maybe even be able to provide an update, but there has been some members or individuals living in that area that have expressed some interest in, uh, in relocating as well. So uh, as far as Council's direction and, and moving that forward, there has been some progress. Uh, however, it's it hasn't been enforced. It has been at the discretion and the choice of the individuals up there. All right. Um, Councillor Moslin. Thanks, Your Worship. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, I don't want to take up much time, so I'm trying to pick uh, um, uh, a priority for me out of, out of the report. Uh, I guess uh, I can, one thing I do want to say is a big, a big thank you uh, to uh, all the emergency crews that did uh, work uh, through much through this period uh, through Freshet 2020. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that our own crews and volunteers, as well as imported crews, got the experience of dealing with uh, the Tiger Dams. Uh, I, you know, I guess my question is, would it behoove us to own and store our own Tiger Dams? So uh, I guess that, that would be my question um, for the report. Thanks, Your And I can see that being addressed over the next while. If it makes sense, we're going to hear about it from our CAO. Sure. So, 
Do you worship? That's a question I was asked by council when I first got here and had some discussion with Justin and Graham. I mean, a big component is once we understand where these dikes are going to go, we're going to have a better understanding of where our risk lies moving forward. The dikes may not hit all areas or there may be some key areas or some areas where there's exceptional levels that we may look at. Um, however, it's going to change. It's going to be evolving here over the next little while. Having said that, um, it, I don't know that it's the purchase of the dams, and, and this is where I'll lean on Graham a little bit, more so than the actual expertise to implement and, and deploy them properly and make sure they're anchored and, and really make sure that it's done appropriately. That's probably where we would, would have our biggest challenge. And maybe even George has some comments as overseeing that, in, that mobilization this time. Yeah, I don't know. We'll go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Through the mayor, yes, councillor. So one of the biggest uh, things for us was having the tiger dams here on site. And again, as Duncan mentioned, the biggest issue that we have is setting them out, uh, setting them up, making sure that they're uh, that they're put up to a certain standard, anchored well, uh, and there's going to be no issues with uh, with access things like that. Uh, so that, that's really the biggest. It, it's it's really labor intensive to get them, uh, you know, unfolded and, and set up. So that's really the biggest issue that I see. Yeah, I think, and to build on that, George, I think we had approximately 60 individuals doing the install, and it took two two days to install the Tiger Dams through the downtown core. That's correct. And we had some some pretty big ambitions to, to have dams in other locations, and unfortunately lost some of those resources and were unable to install in those in those locations. So. It would be a big endeavor, Councillor, and I guess what we're saying is it's definitely something we can do, but it, it's probably going to become more manageable after we know where these dikes are going to go and what those key locations are. I think at that point you could really, you could really, you know, come up with a plan that we could probably handle internally. But at this point, it's such a large undertaking. We need those provincial resources. It's good, to, as Duncan said, it's good to have the, uh, the draw on the provincial resources for the setup. I don't think as a city we could do it alone. Um, we just couldn't. Again, Duncan mentioned 60 people to set it up uh, over two days. We demoed in over two days with just a, a crew of 20 BC wildfires. So a lot less crew to, to do the demo, but it was quite quick, but uh, very labor intensive for setup. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Council, I certainly want to compliment Outside Works on the quality of flowers and planters and making our city look good. I'm sure you agree that there's been some real attention to making sure that we're uh, looking good out there. Uh, and big thanks to uh, Outside Works and the garden crew. Further comments on this? All those in favor of accepting the uh, reports from the monthly reports? Carried. Thank you. And moving down into information items, so these are not looking for decisions. The uh, LED lights and, and uh, Donaldson Drive issue, I'll leave this to uh, Mr. Redfern. Sure, and I'll ask Morris to maybe pop up here, but I'm, I'm going to summarize it very, very briefly because Council's been in this meeting for a while and has some other. Uh, so other meeting coming forward here in a little bit. Um, so I guess the first piece regarding Donaldson Drive, uh, there was a question regarding pedestrian safety, the one way, whether that could be blocked off. Essentially, Morris has done some work in that area and really trying to highlight that there is a pedestrian crossing with some new signage. Also, the lines have been repainted. Uh, repainted. It is a one way. Uh, unfortunately, you couldn't block off that access without um, restricting access to some of the businesses along that uh, along that road. So it will have to remain accessible from the highway until such point as a whole kind of replant is in that area. And uh, we've done what we can to highlight the pedestrian safety and, and increase awareness. The second piece around the lighting in the downtown, essentially upon a review, uh, we could spend some money in updating the lighting and replacing some of the balls. Uh, bulbs down in that area and, and whatnot. However, really we need to look at an overall plan and even a replacement strategy for that area. And so what Morris has indicated in here is part of the 2021 budget. 
we'll look at essentially a revamp in that area. It is, it is very beautiful and it does improve the aesthetics in that area. Uh, however, right now we might be throwing money at not if we were to go in there and do some of the smaller uh, replacements when really we need an overall re, re jig replan. I'll leave it there. All right, thank you. And uh, council, any comments on this? Seeing no hands going up. <laughs> Councilor Thompson. Um, thank you. Um, just a question. You're going to put it in the uh, budget for 2021. Yep. Um, are you in, in to, to the festive season in 2020? Are you going to be um, putting them up, back up again, or what's the plan? Um, at this point, um, we, we're waiting for some uh, direction from council to uh, move forward. Uh, I can put a budget forward uh, in the 21 plan. Yeah, so, and so to build off that, to answer your question, Councillor Thompson, we're going to do some minimal repairs as far as replacing the vaults, but there will not be any substantial change. Um, again, it's, it's, it's kind of spending money in which we're going to redo, hopefully in 2021, provided this is something Council wants to continue down the path with. Right now, I don't want to say it's so far gone, but there's an incredible amount of work and, and you're better to, to start new. You have the tree growing over some of the infrastructure that limits our ability to, to change it or move it around or even replace it. You really have some issues and there are some better options out there. So we're going to do the minimal amount of work because we recognize we might be pulling it all down to redo it next year anyway. And basically that's what I was asking and I'm glad to hear that, that there will be something up in 2020. All right, Council, um, moving to the last item on our list, which is the video streaming issue. And uh, Councillor Zelensky did have his hand I'm up. sorry, Councillor Zelensky, I didn't see that. Yeah, just a quick comment, and, um, and I don't know all the details, but way back when Sasha Bird was here, Council was dealing with that cross crossing over Highway 3. Uh, maybe Councillor Thompson can add to it, but there is some history on cro crossing at that location. Um, I think that was more related to the um, to the trail. Uh, trails. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> All right, and so we're moving down to video streaming, and again, uh, back to uh, the Daniel. Daniel. It looks like is handling this. Portfolio. Well, I, I, actually, I, actually, Kevin has been more involved with this one. He's got the audio-video background from from his uh, school, so he can uh, fill council in on that. All right, Kevin, you're on. That's surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as council is aware, uh, we we mentioned this uh, uh, back in in January that we had um, we had heard that. Um, uh, Les Johnson was uh, looking to, to retire from, from uh, having voluntarily uh, been producing uh, council meetings for a, a good number of years. I think we're in 15? 14. 14. Um, so at that time, uh, staff did begin researching um, alternate solutions, uh, you know, whether it's uh, to continue doing things the way, uh, the way we are right now, where it's being uh, video is being streamed through uh, a Facebook or YouTube or, or a similar uh, platform, um, what kind of resources, both people and equipment, would be necessary to, to make that happen. Um, so uh, the company that uh, the council is familiar with that we use for our meeting management, uh, for agendas and minutes and so on, is a company called eScribe. And um, they offer an add-on uh, package uh, that provides uh, video streaming integrated into the existing meetings. Uh, among other things, that means that uh, things are bookmarked so that if you click on a recording after the fact, you, you can click on a particular item and it jumps forward to that point. Um, uh, the, the service that Mr. Johnson's providing right now, he provides the pie chart. Uh, that is all done by hand after the meeting. We were looking at something that was not going to, to uh, require significant staff resources to do post-production uh, in order to, to get things online. Um, so uh, as part of the communications budget for 2020, 
we factored in that, that at some point uh, we were we were not going to uh, be able to, to continue to, to ride off of volunteer uh, labor uh, and uh, and services, and that we would end up having to pay uh, to to provide this. And so um, what we did was um, the eScribe solution includes uh, some of the equipment, not all of it, but some of it. Uh, plus hosting, streaming, uh, integration into our existing meeting management. Um, we need to provide uh, camera and, and audio. Um, and uh, eScribe has uh, assured us that uh, by the end of the month, uh, certainly in time for the July meeting, uh, they can have equipment to us. Um, Providing the caveat that uh, the, the level of service that we've become accustomed to uh, with Mr. Johnson's uh, uh, efforts, multiple cameras, video switching, um, and so on, uh, we're looking at starting uh, at a much more basic uh, level than that. A single camera um, that um, we start streaming at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, there would be the option uh, included to put agendas on the screen and, and, and stream that out. Uh, but not getting into multiple cameras and so on. Um, having said that, my background uh, going way back is in, in uh, the uh, television industry, and so uh, I do have a plan, but that would be something we would be looking to, to bring forward in, in the uh, capital budget for 2021 to, to expand, but this would move us off. Where this became a little bit more, more time sensitive was um, uh, we did hear in January that Mr. Johnson wanted to uh, to, to step down from this. Um, we've kind of dragged him along as we went through COVID and some other things that were slowing down our transition. Um, unfortunately, the website that he provides the archiving through was up for renewal uh, at the end of the month, and so it, it kind of became time sensitive that either that had to be to be uh, you know resubscribed for another annual uh, deal. Um, or we, we bite the bullet and make the change. And so we are, we are prepared to do that, but just wanted to give council that update that we are looking at, at, at making this change. It's already been budgeted for, so we're not looking for a decision. This is just an update that we have a plan in place and a timeline for that to, to go ahead. All right, uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, yes. Um just wanted to say a uh, uh, huge thank you to Les for his many, many years of service to council. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just been so appreciated by not only council, but the community as a whole. But my question on, on your um, demo, Kevin, is with this new system, will the public be permitted to ask questions during committee of the whole as they are now so for that we are going to have to look at a at an alternate way of doing that right now it's just being posted through facebook chat and so we will probably have to look at an, like an email option or some other way of doing that uh, eScribe themselves do not have that interaction built into their streaming it's strictly a video uh, play out platform uh, there, there is an add-on to the video conferencing piece that they recently released that allows for public input during meetings. However, it wasn't our first uh, first step here. We simply wanted to get the video system going, uh, given the urgency here that we currently have, so we can ensure that uh, the transparency is upheld and we can broadcast to the public in open, fair ways. Okay, Councillor Studley. Hey, yes, me and Neil usually watch the feed during the meeting, so we have no problem um, relating Facebook messages that pop up. We wouldn't be streaming through Facebook anymore. This would be an independent uh, platform through the city website. Oh, okay, so it's the after the fact would be up then. Yeah, so, so, uh, well, anyway, so we can certainly put the links on Facebook, but um, we would not be looking at what, what we've got currently got uh, where we've got that Facebook chat, we will have to look at it, some alternate way of doing that, unless the decision is to open a Facebook, uh, you know, page specifically for that purpose. And Kevin would be live, though. Yeah. To you, you Councillor Shuley would be live. Yeah, the, the video streaming would be live. It's just a matter of how we're going to collect that interaction. Lots of options. Mr. Johnson, speaker at his own wake. <laughs> Go for so it. So my suggestion would be if. 
if the eScribe uh, <clears throat> output provides a, a, an embed or a link like YouTube does, you could put that on Facebook, then somebody could just start a Facebook watch party and then Councillor uh, um, Zach here could, you know, monitor that and... Absolutely, and yeah, yeah def definitely, uh, definitely some options there for us to look at. Um, the big thing is to get, uh, you know, to get the infrastructure in place uh, so that we, we don't, you know, miss a meeting at all. Um, and, you know, the nice thing is that uh, once we're through uh, June, our July meeting is not until late in the month, so that does buy us some time to worry, worry about some of those details and get them publicly available so that people know that as a change is going to happen, that, that we're ready to, to describe how that change is going to impact their abilities to watch and participate. Okay, closing in on three hours, Councillor Moslin, then Councillor Zielinski. Thanks, thanks, Your Worship, and thanks, Les, again. Uh, I, I guess I've got a couple questions. Uh, as we relearn re how to meet, will this eScribe uh, methodology uh, be compatible with Zoom? Yeah, so what we're, what we're setting up is we will have uh, two, cam two inputs. One of them will be the, the, the camera in the room, uh, but the other will be uh, for doing things like the agenda. But as that is how we are also putting Zoom up on the screen in council chambers, that same thing would flow through. So absolutely, uh, that would not impact our ability to, uh, to use uh, Zoom or other electronic meetings. Okay, and one other question, perhaps again, more troubling, uh, perhaps through you, Mayor, to Mr. Johnson. Uh, he, Mr. Johnson has uh, carefully uh, cataloged past council meetings and made them available through his website. Uh, now that that website is going down, what has happened to those videos? Uh, I'm assuming they'll still be in Mr. Johnson's possession. Uh, yeah, I, well, <clears throat> okay, so the source material, I have maybe four or five one terabyte external drives. The actual recorded meetings that are produced, they're all sitting on my YouTube channel and I don't have to pay a cent for my YouTube channel, so that's not going away. And they're organized in playlists, so all the meetings from 2018 are in one list, all from 2019 and another, et cetera, et cetera. So if people wanted to actually go and review meetings that had already happened, they could do that. And the, uh, the thing is, when you look at a YouTube video, below it there's a text area where you can put in a description and more information. And I always put in there a list of the agendas and the, the items and the times. So even though there's no pie chart, you can actually click on one of those things and the, the meeting video just advances to that point. So that functionality is still there too. It's just that the website itself I have to pay for and if I'm not doing this and I'm not doing anything else that's kind of like this, then why should I even have to pay for it? So that's the deal. All right, magic. Any further questions from council? Zelensky. Councillor Zelensky. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I too would like to, to thank Les for his uh, years of service. Um, it, it's great to, great to have this for our community, and it's uh, definitely a bonus over and above what other municipalities have, so it's uh, been very good for us. Um, and I was just wondering whether this is the time where we have a discussion of uh, what there are next meetings going to be a Zoom meeting? Are we going to continue with this or whether we're going to have that discussion later? Okay, adding to this, uh, that question of next plans here. Yeah, so through you, Your Worship, I mean, ultimately we're, we're limited and we need to come up with a plan for the public. But as far as council yourselves, you know, we had some options this meeting. The first step is getting council back in this room so we can figure out how we can adjust to kind of the new reality or the new normal as they call it. Once we figure out some logistics on how we're going to have council in here, then we can figure out how we're going to introduce the gallery into it next. So really, as far as steps go, the next step needs to be council coming back in here, knowing that you always have that option of staying electronic, you know, perpetually. It's allowed through a procedural bylaw. So. Uh, but that's the next step. We need to get council in here so we can figure out how we rejig things so we can next invite the, the public. Okay, council. That's it. Um, we're meeting again at.
questions from the public. We have some yeah, questions I, I from the public? I do. I do. Oh, okay. Uh, Daniel, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So um, I, I've received since uh, Friday afternoon, I had some, and, and I sent all the emails to council by now that I received up, up until now. There, there's a, a group of concerned citizens and business owners now about the potential closure, temporary closure of Market Avenue. Right, I did get that. So, so there was uh, Ms. Suki Lawrence uh, from the U.S. Trading, uh, uh, Lawrence and Lawrence, um, uh, Connie, I believe. Um, sent in a very small uh, a petition to council uh, with nine different businesses uh, from uh, Market App on there, which basically uh, they're asking for uh, to not to not have this change done right now, but further uh, consultation and a more inclusive survey is is kind of needed um, to to do this change in the downtown. Um, so. I have, um, I've also received five individual emails. Again, council has the list of the businesses um, that are opposed. We also have a list of businesses that obviously have uh, signed a letter beforehand wanting this closure. So Ms. Lawrence asked me uh, to, to present this at, at this uh, committee of the whole meeting so that council has the information before making a decision, decision this afternoon at the regular meeting. Uh, regarding this. Uh, this information obviously is brand new and wasn't there while we were writing our reports either on this. Um, I have, uh, and this is included as well in your guys' package, the, um, a, a local resident who also works downtown is opposed towards this. Uh, somebody from the village of Midway has commented that they drive to town and like to park on market because uh, that's centrally located and are against the closure. Um, somebody from Greenwood as well, um, so a similar interest there. Uh, one local business here um, from, um, from Jogas here, they were hoping to make it a one-way street permanently. Now, one-way street is actually not recommended from the traffic engineer, um, so that, that's a different story. And then again, uh, another uh, email from um, Liddy Lawrence um, asking for basically more consultation and working on a uh, marketing strategy, marketing plan beforehand, before doing this closure. Um, so anyways. This report will be this afternoon. Yeah, so I, I, was, I, was, yeah, I was asked for presenting this beforehand in what way this was possible, and I offered my services for that. Okay, so council, this isn't for debate at this point, but for information for further on in the day, uh, you've all received copies of it in your email. Is that it? We're back here at, oh, just a moment, Mr. Johnson. This was not on the agenda, but this is the Committee of the Whole. Uh, I was talking with somebody uh, a week and a half ago about Ruffle and the uh, what will happen to the buildings, and I see Graham's here, and maybe he can inform this. Um, if we had to demolish all those buildings, how much does that shorten our landfill's lifespan? So, I'll, and I'll jump in. Graham, definitely come up here, for sure. And, and I'll lead off to say, last through your worship, Council has a number of decisions that we're kind of working our way through. And, and the first step was in purchasing the home, and that's been the, the focus and the priority to date. The next step is what's Council's appetite moving forward regarding real estate, real estate strategies, what to do with some of those homes. Graham's done an incredible amount of work with our, our contractors and consultants to understand exactly what we have now and what those potentials are. But really the decision points, uh, and we expect we'll be coming here in the next meeting or two, really are going to fall to council and that'll dictate what goes to the landfill and that'll roll out as far as how much life cycle is left, etc, etc. That decision hasn't been made yet, I guess, in the roundabout answer that we gave. Those, those decisions haven't been made right now. Graham, I would say, or I would ask you maybe to comment on the number of homes over there, kind of where we're at with our our assessment of them. Sure. So the, um, through the mayor, uh, thank you. The, uh, Staff's recommendation coming to council will be uh, looking at a variety of options, including resource recovery, uh, including ways to reduce the landfill costs and impacts on the landfill life cycle. Um, you know, those are important for both greenhouse gas considerations as well as this overall 
sustainability there. Um, some of the recommendations coming forward also deal with you know, how council will use these as housing resources in the future. And so I think over the next two meetings, uh, there will be decisions that council will be asked to consider with uh, some various inputs from staff and consultants. Okay. Sorry to build off of that. One of the questions that I know council has received, and so it's a great opportunity to address that as well as regarding salvage. And salvage is something um, that council passed a resolution at the last meeting that essentially said, you know, at this point, uh, residents can salvage from from their homes um, however uh, that's going to be limited to salvage that's not going to compromise our Hampshire Council on any future decisions right. and so the council hasn't made those decisions as far as what the intended and future uses of those homes once those decisions start to filter out then those salvage off, uh, options may be expanded it's, it's really just trying not to get too ahead of, uh, too far ahead of ourselves the cart ahead of the horse a little bit so right kind of one step at a time. First step, purchase the home. Second step, you know, here's some assessment on what we now have and here's your options moving forward and then so on. Okay. Sounds like you're, you've got a lot of stuff to work on. I won't try and kneel you down on a, a worst case, best case scenario of how much time. They've done an yeah. incredible job with in Justin Gray and that department and, and uh, consultants. Just an incredible amount of work has been done trying to understand the program and the progress that's been made exceptional they've done a great job amazing okay council um that's it we have no further from the community and Mr. Says thanks to daniel that's it thank you to daniel okay. thanks all right call this meeting to adjourn and we're back here at two two o'clock